For almost 10 years, the United States had been tirelessly searching for one man, Osama bin Laden, the terrorist mastermind behind the September 11th attacks that killed almost 3,000 Americans and triggered a war that was still raging today, May 2, 2011. While the United States had toppled the Taliban, the government that was sheltering bin Laden at the time of the attacks, they had never been able to capture or kill the man. That was about to change. The CIA had been searching for bin Laden's secret base for years with no luck. He had managed to escape from Afghanistan, which was under U.S. occupation, and travel to the neighboring country of Pakistan. But in the mountains, rural regions of Pakistan, with little government oversight, it was easy for him to stay under the radar. The government had been looking for leads for years, but finally got their break in 2010, when their leads led them to a compound in Abbottabad. They began taking surveillance footage of the compound and determining the best way to breach it. What followed was one of the trickiest intelligence gathering operations in U.S. history. The compound was heavily guarded and in enemy territory. The U.S. had to rely heavily on local help to gather intelligence and over a period of months they spied on the three-story building. They learned every detail about the building but a lot was still missing. For one thing, the infamous terror leader was incredibly secretive, so secretive that they were never able to capture an image of him coming in or out of the building, so everything was still circumstantial. But after an extended period of time, they were able to conclude that this was where Osama bin Laden was. Now it was time to take action. It was April 29th when President Obama was briefed on the details of the operation. Many within his security team were skeptical about the operation. After all, if it went wrong, top US troops would either be killed or remain trapped behind enemy lines. Not only would this be a disastrous loss of life, but it would potentially expose many of the US's biggest secrets if they were interrogated and forced to reveal classified info. And with the doubts that bin Laden truly was in the compound, many didn't feel it was worth the risk. Ultimately, the president disagreed, and he gave the okay to the operation that would become Operation Neptune Spear. And the people carrying it out would be the best of the best. Meet SEAL Team 6, an elite squadron of the highly trained Navy SEALs. They answer directly to the Joint Special Operations Command and carry out some of the most highly classified operations in the US government. These include hostage rescue, special espionage missions, counterterrorism, targeting of enemy infrastructure, and direct action against the deadliest of US enemies, like Osama bin Laden. They would be briefed on the mission, which would be classified as capture or kill. Officially, the US has the policy of never killing an enemy who had already surrendered, but no one involved in the mission had any delusion that Osama bin Laden would ever surrender. And to pull this off, they had to implement some risky strategies. The planning had been going on for the better part of a year, since the intelligence reports started coming in and many strategies had been considered. The easiest would have been a joint operation with Pakistani military forces, but the Pakistani government wasn't exactly friendly, and the US was worried that bin Laden could be tipped off in advance. The US also considered striking at the compound with stealth bombers, which could atomize bin Laden, but there would be no way of following up to ensure he was already dead, and the tricky terror leader had managed to escape US operations before. So instead, the government decided to go old school. SEAL Team 6 would be flown in using modified Black Hawk helicopters that were designed to be quiet and would be able to fly in under enemy radar. The Pakistani military had been heavily trained and supplied by US advisors, so their capabilities were known, and the US was confident they could get around them. The goal was to get to the compound without being detected or challenged by the Pakistani forces, and once the target was down, they would be able to beat a hasty retreat. May 1st, 1.22 p.m. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta received word from the President and directed Admiral William McRaven to move ahead with the operation. Within the next two hours, President Obama and his national security team would move to the Situation Room to watch the whole thing unfold over night vision images transmitted to them from a drone. The roughly 24 Navy SEALs sent on the mission would temporarily be transferred to the control of the CIA, so it would technically not be a military mission and would not be classified as an act of war. These were going to be some of the most critical minutes in the US's modern history, and for the men on the ground, every single minute would count. While the roughly two dozen SEALs were the ones who would breach the compound, there were 79 commandos and a dog involved in the raid. The dog, a Belgian Malinois named Cairo, was there to alert the SEALs to any sudden activity, including the Pakistani military approaching the compound or anyone trying to escape. The core team was backed up by a dog handler, interpreters, pilots, intelligence agents, and tech experts who would make it all possible. But the success or failure of the mission would hinge on the men entering the compound, and one wrong move could spell doom. 3.30 AM, give or take. Two helicopters descend on the Abbottabad compound, while the other helicopters stand by in case they're needed. These two will carry out the primary mission. 
Flying low to the ground, the stealthy Black Hawk helicopters hover over the compound grounds. While the first deploys ropes to lower its team to the ground, the other heads to the far northeast corner to covertly drop off its interpreter, dog, handler, and four seals. If everything went smoothly, they would soon be at the compound. But everything didn't go smooth. While the helicopters weren't detected and they didn't come under hostile fire, Mother Nature had something to say. The first helicopter flew into what's known as a vortex ring state, an air phenomenon caused by a higher than expected temperatures creating an air vortex. The rotor's air pressure didn't diffuse properly, the helicopter was knocked off balance, and it grazed the back of the compound wall. The tail rotor was seriously damaged, and the helicopter started rolling over. The quick-thinking pilot drove the helicopter into the ground nose first, preventing a total collapse, and the SEALs and crew were able to escape unscathed after a rough landing. Now the only question was, had this blown their secret mission? The answer seemed to be no, as there was no sign of aggression from the compound. The SEALs had successfully weathered a crash landing without being detected, the helicopter was secure against the compound walls, and the other helicopter had landed safely outside the compound. The rest of the team was scaling the walls, and the whole team was reunited. The next step was breaching the compound, and that's where the SEALs' explosives team came in. They needed to get in quickly and hit people inside with shock and awe. Outside preparation was key, but once they were inside, every second would count. Ten years of searching had come down to this. 3.33 AM To get through the security, the SEALs used portable explosives to blow open the doors of the compound's guest house one by one. They breached the compound and began storming up the stairs. The first room they encountered on the first floor contained two adult males, but neither was Osama bin Laden. They were detained, but they weren't the target. More disturbing, every floor seemed to contain small groups of children. This wasn't just a terrorist compound, it was home where the terrorists kept their families, regardless of the danger they were putting them in. And with every floor the SEALs ascended, the danger would escalate. 335. What happened next? Reports of that may vary. As they reached the second floor, they encountered more resistance. This is where bin Laden's courier, Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti, was found, and SEAL Mark Owen would controversially write a book on the firefight. He claimed that al Kuwaiti was armed and fired on the SEALs. While one SEAL was lightly injured, they returned fire and killed the evil courier. However, intelligence sources later said that the SEALs were able to get the drop on the man after cutting power to the compound and eliminated him without him fighting back. What was clear is that they still hadn't encountered the man himself. 337. It was time to ascend once again, and the resistance became fiercer the further the SEALs headed into the house. They'd encountered the courier, as well as his brother and wife, and all enemies had either been killed or captured. As they ascended the staircase, they encountered another enemy, and this one provided a glimmer of hope. After the Al-Qaeda soldier was killed, the SEALs identified him as a son of Osama bin Laden, one of the terror leader's many progenies who followed in his footsteps. And if he was there, odds were good his father wasn't far away. 339. There was only one floor left to be breached, the third, and the SEALs were stealing themselves for yet another disappointment. This was clearly a high-level Al-Qaeda compound, but bin Laden had been notorious for staying one step ahead of his pursuers, and he could be far away by now. But as they breached the third floor, it became clear this time was different. In the third floor's main room was Osama bin Laden, seemingly unarmed and wearing the loose-fitting tunic he was usually seen wearing in his many propaganda videos. The SEALs got their first glimpse of him as he stuck his head out of the bedroom and they didn't miss their opportunity. They immediately fired, wounding him. However, he was able to retreat back into the bedroom, and the SEALs pursued. The room was revealed to contain many of bin Laden's female relatives, including several of his wives. One approached the SEALs as if she were charging, and the SEALs quickly shot her to wound, grabbing her and advancing further toward the terror leader. Osama bin Laden had nowhere left to run, and America's most skilled soldiers were right outside his door. What happens next? Reports vary. Matt Bissonnette, one of the SEALs on site, claims that bin Laden had been mortally wounded by the initial shots as they approached. His wives were trying to protect him, and the SEALs were forced to act as any one of them could have an explosive device. But when they pushed past them, they found bin Laden on the ground, mortally wounded. As he moved, they fired multiple shots and neutralized the terror leader for good. But another SEAL had a very different story. Robert J. O'Neill would become one of the first SEALs to identify himself as one of the men on the mission and had a much more dramatic recollection of the events. In his retelling, Osama bin Laden might have been wounded, but he was far from neutralized. In fact, he was strong enough to grab one of the women in the room and hide behind her, using her as a human shield. As bin Laden pushed the hapless woman toward the SEALs, O'Neill quickly fired two shots directly into bin Laden's forehead and killed him. Which report was accurate? The Navy after-action report favors Bissonnette's retelling. And just like that, one of the most notorious enemies of the United States was no more. The SEAL team radioed back, forgotten country Geronimo Geronimo Geronimo, officially confirming that the enemy had been killed in action. 
The entire affair had taken less than 15 minutes from landing to the elimination of Osama bin Laden, one of the most efficient operations in US military history, and it had been completed without a single death or serious injury to the entire Navy SEAL team. Watching from the Situation Room, President Obama uttered the words the entire White House team had been waiting to hear. We got him. But the mission wasn't over just yet. 355. The SEAL team members quickly sprung into action, securing bin Laden's body and moving it downstairs. They would be exiting shortly, but there was still some extensive cleanup work to do. The compound might be a source of vital intelligence, and they thoroughly searched the room and surrounding area. They found two weapons in the room, an assault rifle and a pistol, but the efficient team had managed to neutralize bin Laden before he could reach them. They weren't loaded, indicating the Al-Qaeda leader was not expecting a firefight. But what to do about the other residents? Almost everyone who had engaged the US troops with weapons had been killed, but the compound was full of civilians. The US had no desire to take all the women and children found there into custody, so they non-violently restrained them and left them outside the compound to be found by Pakistani forces. Most didn't put up any resistance, besides the injured wife of bin Laden, Amal Ahmed Abdul Fattah. She berated the SEALs in Arabic for the entire duration of the cleanup mission, and it seemed the Yemeni woman was a true believer in her late husband's mission. She, like most of the people found there, would eventually be deported from Pakistan back to their home countries in the Middle East. And now it was time to make a clean getaway. 405. Bin Laden's body and every important piece of intelligence or evidence had been secured. Taking what they needed, the first helicopter was loaded and primed for takeoff. Much like the landing, this was a low takeoff to avoid detection. For those back in the US, the SEALs were heroes, but this was an unauthorized mission, and it was unlikely the Pakistani forces would be grateful if they were caught there. But much like the first time, SEAL Team 6 pulled off a perfect getaway and exited the compound. But there was one more matter to attend to. 408. The damaged Black Hawk helicopter that crashed into the compound would not be leaving through the sky, and Pakistani forces would be there shortly. The chopper contained vital information about US military capabilities, because it wasn't just a standard helicopter and had been outfitted with stealth features. So before they departed, the troops used the same portable explosives like the one they'd used to breach the compound and gave their fallen chopper an explosive send-off. This only took minutes, and soon one of the backup helicopters brought on the mission arrived, scooping up the remaining SEALs and flew them off to join the first helicopter. The mission was over, and now it was time for a long ride. 553. The ride back was over an hour and a half, more than three times the length of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. But now that it was over, they had to get back to safe territory, back in US-occupied Afghanistan, where the Americans had been fighting since the days after September 11th terror attacks. While it was unlikely the Pakistanis would fire on a US chopper if it was detected, a stealthy escape would go much smoother. So the US troops had some disinformation efforts. As the various explosions led to crowds before takeoff, an Urdu-speaking American military officer claimed it had been a Pakistani operation being carried out at the compound and to keep their distance. It worked, and the Americans landed safely at Bagram Airfield, carrying the body of Osama bin Laden. Now it was time to deal with the aftermath. 701. Back at the White House, the celebration was tempered by one question. Was it really him? Bin Laden was infamous for using body doubles, and there had been multiple times where it was thought he had been killed, only for it to turn out to be a feint. So everyone waited anxiously for the results of the preliminary examinations of the corpse, and over an hour after the SEALs arrived in Afghanistan, a new report came in indicating that the notorious rogue was actually dead. This time, the United States had gotten their man, and the American public was about to find out. It was the evening of May 1st when word started going around that the president was going to be making a speech on TV that night. Usually, when Barack Obama made a planned speech, it was early in the evening during prime time, often to the annoyance of everyone who was trying to watch their favorite TV show. But this unplanned speech on short notice was different, and political watchers kept waiting until the president ascended the podium at less than half an hour to midnight. And as soon as he opened his mouth, people knew this was big. 11.35 Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda and a terrorist who is responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. As the president paid tribute to the many who died in bin Laden's terror attacks, a spontaneous celebration erupted around the country. It was just short of 10 years since the September 11th terror attacks, and many Americans lived in fear of the next attack. As word got around, large groups of fans attending sports games screamed in joy. Democrats exulted in the biggest foreign policy win of the Obama presidency, and Republicans celebrated the end of an enemy while wondering if they should even bother running against him next year. And there was only one thing left to do. 1259. It was a little over an hour after President Obama's speech and the troops had one major piece of business left to attend to. What to do with Osama bin Laden's body? 
The terror leader had been fully tested and examined, and they were sure he was their guy. He had been checked for any vital intel and the body had no more secrets to give up. The only thing left to do was dispose of the body, but there was one problem with that. No one wanted him. Bin Laden was wanted in just about every country on the planet, and even countries where he had sought refuge, Pakistan and Afghanistan, considered him an outlaw. No country would want to give him a grave, because it would be a massive target for radical activity. No one wants to have an Al-Qaeda pilgrimage in your country every year, so why not just cremate his body and be done with it? Cremation is against Islamic tradition, and as hated as the terror leader was, the government still wanted to respect his faith. No need to anger his followers any more than they already were, given that their leader had just been eliminated. Fortunately, there was an alternative. Bin Laden's body was loaded onto the aircraft carrier Carl Vinson, and the US government called the government of Saudi Arabia for approval to dispose of the body. He was a Saudi citizen, after all, and the Saudis were important allies of the US government at the time. And the Saudi response was, we don't care what you do with him, just don't make it our problem. The plan to bury Osama bin Laden at sea was approved, and the body was treated with Muslim religious rites. There was even a brief reading of Arabic religious statements, at which point the body was draped in a white shroud, placed in a bag loaded with hundreds of pounds of iron chains, and placed on a wooden board. As the board was tilted forward, bin Laden's body slipped into the sea ensuring the terror leader would never have a grave that could be visited by loyalists or targeted by enemies. And now that the entire operation was over, there was only the cleanup to attend to. It was roughly 3 a.m. local time in Pakistan when the army chief received a phone call informing the country of the operation that took place in their borders. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff filled him in on the details and likely smoothed over some angry words. While there was some brief dispute of whether any Pakistani forces had been involved, the government denied this, and reports stated that the Pakistani planes which scrambled to the location had only arrived after the US forces had departed. This is not where the aftermath ended, though. The raid that killed Osama bin Laden had played out over less than an hour, but the follow-up would span years. Controversy centered around the legality of the raid on foreign soil. Although the laws passed after 9-11 gave the US wide latitude to eliminate threats abroad, Pakistan wasn't pleased with the US operating on their soil, and the US wanted to know more about bin Laden's network of support in Pakistan. Neither got too many answers. Conspiracy theories persisted about bin Laden's being alive, although the US government releasing some photos of the terror leader's corpse largely put those to rest. And there was one more inevitable act. Once the operation was partially declassified, various members of the team started putting out memoirs. Some varied in details, and most made the person writing the book out to be the hero. So naturally, it wasn't long before Hollywood came calling. Only a year and a half after the death of Osama bin Laden, the movie Zero Dark Thirty was released, and its pick for the hero was a fictional intelligence analyst played by Jessica Chastain. Because it wouldn't be a key moment in American history without Hollywood putting its own spin on it. Osama bin Laden, the world's most wanted man. Not only did he pull off a devastating strike against the US homeland, but he managed to avoid capture and survive for a decade afterwards. What went wrong? And how did this notorious terrorist manage to avoid justice for so long? Turns out that the answer goes back to even before the infamous attacks. Born in Saudi Arabia, bin Laden wasn't some downtrodden underdog who became a terrorist. He grew up in luxury, as the son of a billionaire construction magnate. So, how did he get radicalized? It all started when he joined Pakistani forces fighting against the Soviets in Afghanistan. But he didn't develop his unabiding hatred for the US until the Gulf War where he saw American troops stationed on Saudi soil, so he viewed it as a desecration of the holy Muslim land. Even though the countries were allies, it didn't matter. He was determined to get revenge, and soon would form the Al-Qaeda terror group that would target US interests abroad and at home. And he didn't get a welcome reception at home. His radicalism led to him being expelled from Saudi Arabia and losing his citizenship, so he became a stateless figure looking to hide in any country that supported his cause. His first attack was in Yemen in 1992, where his team bombed a hotel full of US troops. It detonated prematurely, killing two civilians in the parking lot. A year later, the World Trade Center in New York was hit by a bomb in the parking garage, killing six people. While bin Laden was never proven to be involved, the mastermind of the attack trained in Al-Qaeda camps. And two years later, a car bomb exploded at a military base in Saudi Arabia, killing seven people, including five Americans. Bin Laden was on the US radar now, but where was he? At this point, he was hiding out in the African nation of Sudan, which was known to be friendly to Islamic fundamentalists. But the government still had good relations with the United States, and Osama bin Laden came up in conversations between officials and the CIA. Did they offer to hand him over? It's not clear, but what is clear is that the US sniffing around his bases in that country led to bin Laden fleeing at some point. 
heading to his new home base in Afghanistan. Not that he told anyone, Al-Qaeda maintained a presence in Sudan, which would fool investigators for some time, and he was about to step up his operation in a big way. Until now, Al-Qaeda's attacks had been relatively small-scale, with only a few succeeding, but they were about to enter the realm of coordinated attacks, causing much greater damage. Starting with a duo of truck bombs in Kenya and Tanzania, hitting U.S. embassies in both countries in 1998, 12 Americans were killed, but the vast majority of the deaths, over 200, were locals. This was the first time most Americans had heard of Al-Qaeda, and the public wanted revenge. President Bill Clinton wasted no time in responding, but the response wouldn't have the desired effect. Operation Infinite Reach was a series of cruise missile attacks on Afghanistan and Sudan, targeting Al-Qaeda training camps. This was the first official military engagement against a non-state actor, with many anti-war activists claiming it was an illegitimate attack because the U.S. wasn't at war with either of the nations. However, bin Laden wasn't killed by the attacks, and overall Operation Infinite Reach became a propaganda win for the extremist. This was shortly after the radical Taliban group took over Afghanistan, and the militant clerics refused to hand over bin Laden and deepened their ties with him. And so the war of attrition continued. Having proven he could hit big targets, bin Laden's next goal was to sink a U.S. ship. He would make his first attempt in early 2000, but the heavy bomb on the small boat derailed it and it never reached its goal. He learned from that error and delivered a deadly payload to the USS Cole in October 2000, killing 17 sailors. The attack may have influenced the election in the US the following month, but it was only a prelude to what would come less than a year later. Osama bin Laden was still seen as a minor threat, but that was about to change. The September 11, 2001 attacks were the first major attack on the US mainland by Al-Qaeda and the deadliest attack on US soil since Pearl Harbor. Two hijacked planes took down the World Trade Center, and a third hit the Pentagon, killing everyone on board. A fourth plane crashed into a field in Pennsylvania, and it was later revealed that that fourth plane was meant to hit the U.S. Capitol. Osama bin Laden was now public enemy number one, and new President George W. Bush demanded justice. He announced to the world that the Taliban needed to hand bin Laden over now, and the Taliban's response was to demand U.S. ambassadors be sent to negotiate. Given the Taliban's history of taking hostages, this was rejected immediately. The war on terror had officially began. The U.S. began bombing Afghanistan only days after the attacks, with one of their primary goals being to hunt down bin Laden. But where was he? He favored isolated safe houses, moving frequently and traveling with his wives and close associates. Now he sent his wives across the border to Pakistan and traveled from one Taliban-controlled safe house to another. A few months after the war began, he moved to the isolated Tora Bora region where he was near impossible to find due to the rough terrain and the sparsely populated area with few sources to draw on. It would be a long war of attrition from here. Bin Laden didn't give up on attacking the US, but he would never pull off another major attack on the US mainland. Only two months after that attack, the infamous shoe bomber Richard Reed attempted to blow up a plane from Paris to Miami, but failed to successfully ignite the explosives and was restrained on the plane. Security increased massively in the US after the attacks, and Bin Laden's options became limited. He would pull off attacks around the world in less secure locations, but now he was on the defensive. But that didn't mean he was done. Osama bin Laden was the most wanted man in the world. The country he was hiding in was being bombed by the most powerful country in the world. The US government agents were scouting the country trying to hunt him down, and a $25 million bounty had been placed on his head. Despite that, years would go by without any sign of him. Some people speculated that he had been killed in the initial bombings, but occasionally grainy videos of him threatening new attacks would surface. Were these body doubles designed to keep the propaganda alive? No one was sure, but the US kept up the hunt. It would be a long, slow mission, and the true extent of it wouldn't become clear until he was finally found. For most of the time, the US looked for bin Laden in Afghanistan, but that turned out to be a red herring. Afghanistan was the most sympathetic nation to bin Laden, but it was also quickly descending into anarchy. And soon the Taliban would be replaced by a US-friendly government led by Hamid Karzai that created a rudimentary democracy, albeit one that had to fend off attacks from the Taliban forces for its entire duration. But bin Laden can no longer count on the Taliban to shield him, so a year after the 9-11 attacks he traveled with his family across the border into a mountainous region of Pakistan. They moved from safe house to safe house for several years before moving to Abbottabad, where he would build his secret compound. So why did the US not clue in on this sooner? Unlike Afghanistan, Pakistan was ostensibly a US ally. The US was hesitant to anger their government because maintaining good relations with the nuclear power and being able to serve as a mediator for India and Pakistan was important. 
but Pakistan wasn't being forthcoming about what they knew about bin Laden's presence on their soil, and so the US had to rely on third-party sources. The regions where bin Laden stayed were dangerous, and any US soldier caught there couldn't rely on support from Pakistan's government, and the US would likely not be able to rescue them without a diplomatic scandal forming. So, information coming out of those regions was spotty for several years, and bin Laden was able to stay under the radar in Pakistan for all those years, but not forever. The US had to rely on unconventional sources of information for years, including the many detainees they'd captured and held at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. This military prison camp held hundreds of Al-Qaeda soldiers, as well as many people who claimed to just be people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it could be difficult to tell who was who. But amid the sea of interrogations, many of which led to dead ends, one name showed up, Abu Ahmed al Kawati, a man who was supposedly a courier working for bin Laden. It's not known when the officials first got the tip that he was working for bin Laden, but by 2007 they discovered the man's real name, Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed. The government now had its first real link to bin Laden's whereabouts. It would be a multi-year process to find the courier and his location, with it taking almost two years to discover his name to find his hometown, Abbottabad. The US was hesitant to make any moves in Pakistan until it knew more, but now it had a location, and Abbottabad was isolated enough that they could start sending in paramilitary operatives without arousing the suspicion of the Pakistani government. Over the next year, they'd follow Ahmed on his daily missions and track him repeatedly, making an appearance at a surprisingly secure compound that seemed out of place in the mountain town. But even this didn't give them what they needed. The CIA was able to set up a surveillance in the area and take countless shots of the compound. They were able to determine that it was a fortress designed to hide someone of significance. They saw many people coming in and out, but there was only one person they didn't see, Osama bin Laden. If he was inside, he was taking his security very seriously and had not left the compound in a long time. Neither had anyone known to be a member of his family. Not surprising, as his wives and children likely had very little autonomy, but based on the many guests, the CIA's best guess was that he was still living there with his youngest wives. But before they made a move, they needed proof. So began one of the most devious schemes in the operation. How do you get a notoriously paranoid and secretive terror leader to open his front door to you? Simple, you create a face that no reasonable or unreasonable person could object to. The United States recruited Dr. Shaquille Afridi to approach the compound, claiming to be running a vaccination drive. With the help of some nurses, they were able to gain access to the compound to vaccinate the children, and also take some DNA samples that would potentially identify members of the Bin Laden clan. It's not clear if the DNA ever did make its way to the US and provide the final piece of the puzzle, but when Dr. Afridi's role in the manhunt came out, he would become one of Pakistan's most wanted men. No good deed goes unpunished. Now all that was left was scouting out the location. The compound was massive, located on a lot around eight times the size of the largest houses in Abbottabad. While the actual house wasn't too large, the security ballooned it to many times its size. Surrounded by concrete walls up to 18 feet wide and topped with barbed wire, the only way in was through security gates, and there was no way to do digital spying on the compound because there was no internet or phone service on the base so anyone hoping bin Laden would hack into some unsecured Wi-Fi was going to be disappointed. The third floor balcony had an additional 7-foot wall shielding it from the public eye, and not even trash left the compound. The residents would regularly bury it. The compound was set for a war, and that's what it would get. But back home, it was a very different story. While Osama bin Laden was public enemy number one after the 9-11 attacks, soon he faded from the headlines. George W. Bush, who vowed to get bin Laden dead or alive, soon got distracted and launched a war to displace dictator Saddam Hussein in Iraq. He was re-elected, but the second half of his presidency would be defined by mounting casualties in Iraq, a devastating hurricane, and a terrible financial crisis in 2008. By that point, bin Laden had largely disappeared, and few people considered the hunt for him a top priority anymore. Bush would be replaced by liberal Barack Obama in 2009, and Obama vowed to disengage from Iraq and focus more on domestic affairs. He, too, had a troubled presidency and his re-election was seen doubtful after his party took a shellacking in the 2010 midterms. And at this point, many people didn't even know if bin Laden was alive or dead. The US had never given up the hunt, but much of it happened far away from prying eyes. Many people initially speculated that bin Laden had died in the initial bombings or died due to illness in the ensuing years, but there wasn't any proof either way. A 2005 book interviewing al-Qaeda detainees disclosed that he had escaped from Tora Bora into Pakistan, but reports that he had a serious kidney disorder made it seem to many like he might have just quietly died far away from the public eye. 
The US never publicly bought into the rumors, maintaining that he was a threat, but the lack of any new information made the public start turning out. And at a certain point, he started turning from terror leader to boogeyman in many people's eyes. For most people, their only connection to Osama bin Laden during these years was ill-sourced newspaper reports. Some were credible reports of where he might be hiding, others claimed he was dead or he might have changed his identity, maybe some claimed he was hiding out in Los Angeles with Elvis and Bat Boy. And as the attacks against the US homeland stopped and everyone got used to going through metal detectors and taking off our shoes at the airports, he started seeming less like a threat and more like a past figure. The government stopped giving the public updates and most people assumed we'd never know the truth of what happened to him. Which was why everyone was surprised when the Bin Laden issue roared back into the mainstream media. In the years leading up to 2011, the CIA had staked out a place in Badabad and used informants and technology to learn everything they could about the compound. This included a drone that mapped every element of the house they could, ensuring that the team sent in would be as well informed as possible. They also used advanced spyware and tracking devices to pick up any cell phone signals in the immediate vicinity, even if the compound itself had no technology. Ironically, the size and security of the compound might have worked against Bin Laden because it was so large it could be observed from multiple angles. And after years of intelligence gathering, a decision was made. The CIA and related organizations brought their intel to the president's desk, and Barack Obama had the most impactful decision of his career awaiting him. White House counterterrorism advisor John Brennan and CIA director Leon Panetta were heavily involved in the planning, and they developed Operation Neptune Spear as a kill or capture operation. The US had the policy of not killing any enemy who surrendered, no matter how much blood they had on their hands. But no one expected bin Laden to surrender, and everything around the operation was based on that assumption. So it sounds like an easy decision. Well, not quite. Vice Admiral William McRaven, the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, was one of the first to be briefed on the mission after the president. A veteran of special ops, he felt the commando team would be the best equipped to take out Osama bin Laden. A bombing strike wouldn't guarantee a kill, and bin Laden's body might never be identified. Plus, if there were civilian casualties, it could be seen as an act of war against Pakistan. But that was also the biggest challenge here how to handle relations with Pakistan. No one knew how closely linked the Pakistani government was with the Al-Qaeda leader. If the US government brought the intel to them and asked for a joint operation, they could get their man or Pakistan could tip the terror leader off and allow him to disappear once again. They decided to go it alone. President Obama met with the National Security Council to hash out the details of the plan. Quickly ruling out the joint operation, Obama was hesitant to send a US team into harm's way. He seemed to favor a bombing mission at first, but the CIA said they weren't positive that there wasn't an underground bunker at the base. That meant a bombing mission might not do the job, and with little way to conduct post-mission intel, the truth might never come out. The bombs powerful enough to destroy an underground bunker would cause collateral damage, so that plan was put on hold. And instead, McRaven was tasked with developing a foolproof plan for a commando raid, and it would fall on the best of the best. The Navy SEALs picked for their mission were among the most elite soldiers in the US military, most having 10 or more deployments to Afghanistan, and skills including border infiltration and foreign language knowledge. They were brought in without being told the details of the mission, and engaged in rehearsals of the raid in test compounds built in multiple locations. Whatever this mission was, it was big enough that the government built a massive facility just to train for it. When they were told that the government had found Osama bin Laden and it was their job to take him down, reportedly, every single one of them burst out cheering. Now that they knew the mission, they would be briefed on the last few details of the raid. They'd be flown in on modified Black Hawk helicopters designed to be quiet and nearly invisible on radar. The US had supplied much of Pakistan's military equipment and trained their soldiers, so they knew their capabilities and how to get around them. And they were confident they could counter them if they came under attack. But the goal was for Pakistan to know nothing about the raid until it was already done. If bin Laden had surrendered, he would be held at a nearby Air Force base, but that was unlikely and the SEALs were informed that if they were captured, the government would negotiate for their release. But they wouldn't be able to send in a rescue mission. Now it all hinged on one man. Was this raid too risky? Was the president really willing to put a team of Navy SEALs behind enemy lines on what would likely be an assassination mission? If the mission succeeded, it would be the biggest foreign policy coup of the administration. But if it failed, Barack Obama's presidency would essentially be over. Meanwhile, the military brass was making final plans, including adding an additional helicopter detachment that might be able to help the team fight their way out if they were cornered. Ultimately, the president looked at the plan and gave the go-ahead for the mission that might finally rid the US of its decades-long enemy. And now it was all in the hands of the Navy SEALs.
As the team took to the air and headed for Abbottabad, the president and his closest team members retreated to the Situation Room to watch the raid on closed-circuit cameras. Around 12 SEALs were making their way toward the compound, and their command was transferred to the CIA for the mission so that the U.S. soldiers would technically not be controlled by the U.S. Army while on Pakistani soil. They would be backed up by 67 additional commandos and a military working dog, a Belgian Malinois named Cairo, who would be tracking any escaping people from the compound and alert SEALs to any Pakistani military presence, making him a very good boy indeed. It was time. The two Black Hawk helicopters were accompanied by larger Chinook helicopters, holding back in case they were needed. The first helicopter would hover over the yard while its team rappelled to the ground, as the other copter would be around the perimeter and deploy the rest of the team plus the dog and an interpreter. But as they approached, one of the copters was hit by hazardous airflow conditions that caused it to spin out and be damaged. The pilot was able to avoid a crash, landing with some damage, but without any injuries or alerting security. They were on the ground and now there was one thing left to do, breach the door and take on whoever was inside. On September 11, 2001, terrorists struck the United States and launched the world into a new era, the global war on terror. After decades of Cold War preparations, the US and its allies found themselves unprepared for this new asymmetric war, but they were very quick learners. First though, the US had to deal with the literal wreckage from the attack. Both the Pentagon and the World Trade Center had suffered catastrophic damage, but the Pentagon was only partially destroyed. The World Trade Center would be a near total loss. Immediately upon realizing the homeland was under attack, the United States took the unprecedented steps of ordering all civilian aircraft in US airspace to land at the nearest available airport. Hundreds of aircraft from various nations were all forced to land or face the wrath of the US Air Force, which was not in the mood for discussion that day. Tens of thousands of travelers had their travel plans hopelessly disrupted as aircraft landed on the nearest available airfield all across the US. French tourists on their way to Hawaii were suddenly stuck in Montana, and the shutdown of air traffic affected incoming aircraft as well. U.S. Air Force F-15s and F-16s loaded for air-to-air -air combat immediately took up air defense patrols over the American West and East Coasts, as well as the airspace west of Alaska and north of North America. The United States implemented DEFCON 3, or Defense Condition 3, across all its military facilities around the world. This meant that U.S. forces, especially the Air Force, had to be ready to mobilize at a moment's notice with all the Air Force combat planes ready to take off to the skies within 15 minutes of alert. The U.S. wasn't just worried about further terrorist attacks using civilian airliners. It was sending a clear and strong signal to any would-be adversary that while the U.S. had just taken a nasty sucker punch to the face, it was still on its feet and ready to fight. Any attempts to capitalize on U.S. confusion and weakness and the immediate aftermath of the attacks would be met with immediate and overwhelming force, including nuclear if need be. Civilian aircraft incoming to the United States were immediately ordered to divert and barred from entering American airspace. Anyone wishing to complain could take it up with the Air Force F-15s. Nobody did. Planes were diverted to Canada and Mexico, causing a global aviation logjam and chaos that would last for days. The first priority were search and rescue efforts at both the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. The Pentagon had been a priority target though each hijacker had been instructed that if they couldn't reach their intended targets, they had the freedom to use their own initiative and choose secondary targets. Anyone who couldn't do either or experienced any difficulties was to immediately crash their planes. Also, the very visual symbol of American global power, the Pentagon, had been high on the list of targets. But the attack did only relatively minor damage to the huge structure. 125 Pentagon workers were killed in the attack, 70 civilians and 55 military personnel mostly U.S. Army or U.S. Navy employees. The highest-ranking casualty was Lt. Gen. Timothy Maud, an Army Deputy Chief of Staff. Thanks to reinforced construction techniques, though, the Pentagon was a particularly tough target to take on, and the damage was limited considering the incredible amount of energy released upon impact. At the World Trade Center site, though, things were far more grim. Firefighters from the New York City Fire Department rushed to the scene of the attack and braved the smoke, dust, and raging firestorm above their heads. Falling debris made the task even more difficult after the towers collapsed in on themselves. Engine 10 and Ladder 10 were the first to arrive on scene since their firehouse was directly across the street, and at 8.50 a.m. an incident command post was established in the lobby of the North Tower. However, due to safety concerns, the command post was moved across West Street. This would end up saving the lives of many senior officials, 
though many more died as the North Tower lobby was still being used to coordinate rescue operations when the tower collapsed. Tragically, a repeater system meant to help with radio communications during an emergency had failed due to the attack, and the fire chiefs were unable to contact many of their men when the order to evacuate had been given. As a result, many firefighters and first responders, some who had no radios and had simply shown up in their off-duty hours to assist, were lost in the collapse. 343 firefighters would die from both tower collapses. The command post on West Street was taken out by falling debris, which also killed New York Fire Department Chief Peter Ganchi. A new command post was set up in a firehouse in Greenwich Village, from where a response from half of all New York Fire Department units as well as volunteers from Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester County, and others could be managed. Other volunteers who did not make it to the site instead went to firehouses now short on personnel in order to cover their duties for the duration of the search and rescue efforts. Just hours after the collapse, though, firefighters erected a flag taken from a nearby yacht on the scene of the attack, evocative of the famous Iwo Jima flag-raising photograph. The medical response began immediately after the first impact, with a casualty staging area moved to the corner of Vesey and West Streets. Five triage areas would be set up around the entire site, as volunteers flooded in to assist with the massive number of casualties being brought off the site. Triage centers would be moved to Chelsea Piers and Staten Island Ferry Terminal in the wake of the collapse, while neighboring hospitals sped the flow of critical supplies. Sadly, emergency medical services would end up treating very few individuals, mostly smoke inhalation patients. Truth is, very few people would end up surviving the collapse of the towers. Both medical triage areas were shut down the next day. On the water, the U.S. Coast Guard mobilized as many assets as it could to aid in evacuating people stranded on Manhattan Island. Counterterrorism patrols by watercraft were also conducted in an attempt to thwart any possible follow-up attacks on either civilians or the emergency responders themselves. Short on resources, the Coast Guard sent out a call for ships to assist with the evacuation of Manhattan Island, while other ships such as John J. Harvey were critical in firefighting efforts. With many water mains severed by the collapse, the John J. Harvey, a fireboat that had operated since 1930, would speed to the proximity of the site. Alongside two other FDNY fireboats, she pumped water to the site so that firefighters could fight the blaze amongst the wreckage for 80 hours until the water mains were repaired. In eight hours following the attack, anywhere from half a million to a million people were evacuated from Manhattan. In effect, America's own Dunkirk and considered to be the largest maritime evacuation in history. To assist with communications, amateur radio operators set up emergency networks or joined the hundreds of volunteers forming bucket brigades. With official emergency networks completely overwhelmed, their work was invaluable to New York authorities, and on December 12, 2002, the New Jersey legislature honored their work. Rescue efforts at the site, however, were not progressing well. Few had survived the collapse of the towers, and to get to them, the workers first had to dig through two feet of ash and soot. The heavy equipment had to be used to lift up massive blocks of concrete and random wreckage. Incredibly, the day after the attack, though, 11 people would be rescued, including six firefighters and three police officers. Two police officers had survived for a full 24 hours, buried in 30 feet of rubble. But the discovery of survivors would not last long. Only 20 people would be pulled alive from the wreckage, with the last survivor being rescued 27 hours after the collapse of the North Tower. Some of the trapped were able to make cell calls to those above, but debris made it impossible to get to all of them in time. Hundreds of volunteers and officials poured over the scene, with approximately 400 rescue dogs, the largest deployment of dogs in U.S. history, but pretty soon only cadavers were being recovered. With the psychological impact of the rescue dogs so severe that rescue workers had to bury themselves and pretend to be rescued just to lift the animals' flagging spirits. Around New York City, thousands of volunteers began to show up over the next few days to assist in whatever capacity they could. The city would register these individuals and shuttle them into Lower Manhattan, which had been closed off to everyone but rescue and recovery workers. All over New York, construction projects came to a dead stop as workers walked off the job and headed to the site of the attack. By the end of week one, over a thousand iron workers alone arrived at the site, with thousands of other specialists from the US Canada, Mexico, and other nations. Days after the attack, the focus was on investigation and clearing debris. Bucket brigades were organized from thousands of volunteers, with each person passing along a five-gallon bucket full of debris. At the end of each line, investigators sifted through the debris for evidence and human remains, with the rest being deposited into a site known as the pile. As workers wanted to avoid using the term ground zero due to connotations of a nuclear attack, by September 24th, 
100,000 tons of 1.8 million tons had been removed from the site, searched for clues or remains, and sent to the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island. Much of the steel would end up being recycled for use in other construction projects. 24 tons of steel would be used in constructing the USS New York, an amphibious transport dock ship meant to assist in amphibious assaults. Incredibly, through the recovery efforts, someone had attempted to conduct what would have been the heist of the decade. Just days after the collapse, rescue workers discovered scorch marks on a basement doorway underneath 4WTC. Upon exploring the building's basement, a vault containing large amounts of gold and silver coin and bars was discovered, all stored by the Bank of Nova Scotia. The would-be thieves were never discovered, their attempt at a heist likely foiled by the hundreds of rescue workers on the site and the thousands of volunteers just past it. The U.S. military also mounted immediate efforts to assist civilian personnel on the ground. The Civil Air Patrol was one of the few institutions allowed to launch aircraft, and it used the opportunity to conduct an aerial reconnaissance mission over Ground Zero in order to provide analysis of the wreckage. CAP aircraft also assisted in airlifting personnel and medical equipment and supplies. The first military personnel at Ground Zero, however, were elements of the New York Army National Guard's 1 101st Cavalry, 258th Field Artillery, 442nd Military Police Company, and 69th Infantry Regiment. National Guard troops supplemented NYPD and FDNY with 2,250 National Guardsmen, assisting rescue efforts by the next morning. The armory of the 69th Infantry would become a family information center to assist family members of victims in locating their loved ones or recovering their remains. National Guardsmen also provided security to other possible target locations across New York, as well as assisted in traffic control. Soon after, the New Jersey National Guard sent its own personnel to assist. The U.S. Navy redirected its hospital ship, USNS Comfort, to Pier 92 in Manhattan. From there, crew members helped feed and house 10,000 relief workers. Its galley provided 30,000 meals while its medical facilities assisted injured rescue workers immediately after the attack and during the recovery process. With Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda claiming responsibility for the attacks, President Bush immediately declared a war on terrorism with the goal of destroying and dismantling global terror networks. Al-Qaeda would be enemy number one, however. A NATO committee agreed that the attack on the U.S. constituted an Article 5 response, and overnight, Osama bin Laden had brought down the heat of the entire NATO alliance on his head. Across the nation, federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies coordinated to arrest 762 suspects with known or suspected ties to terror networks. However, none of those detained would be charged with terrorism and the response is largely seen as a knee-jerk response to the September 11th attacks. To head off growing Islamophobia by parts of the U.S. population, President Bush visited the Islamic Center of Washington and reminded the nation that Arabs and Muslims living in the U.S. were still patriots. Sadly, a 1,600% surge in hate crimes or harassment of Muslims, Arabs, Middle Easterners, and South Asians would occur in the days immediately following the attacks. Immediately after the attacks, President Bush took legislative action to shut down the financial assets of known terrorists and their financial networks. This froze billions of dollars of assets and would be the first shot of the global war on terror. On September 18, a joint resolution from Congress gives President Bush the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force against the planners and instigators of the September 11 attacks. Two days later, the President announces the start of the global war on terror. Osama bin Laden has horrendously misjudged America's response to the September 11th attacks. He believed that the U.S. would respond in one of two ways, a general pullout of the Middle East or a round of cruise missile strikes against training facilities. Having weathered a storm of missiles before that did little to nothing, bin Laden believed al-Qaeda had won the day. Immediately after the 9-11 attacks, President George Bush signs into law a joint resolution by the American Congress, authorizing the President to use all reasonable force required to bring to justice or eliminate the individuals responsible for carrying out the September 11th attacks. This makes Osama bin Laden public enemy number one, not just by the U.S., but by America's vast network of global allies. Al-Qaeda itself is targeted for destruction, and the Afghanistan Taliban regime sheltering Al-Qaeda is given an ultimatum, hand over AQ operatives or else. Meanwhile, American intelligence operatives are infiltrating northern Afghanistan, with security provided by American special forces. In a series of clandestine meetings, the U.S. develops a plan to work together with the anti-Taliban, so-called Northern Alliance. This alliance is a coalition of anti-Taliban opposition, mostly made up of Tajik factions as well as Uzbek, Hazara Shiite, and some Pashtun Islamist factions. 
Before the September 11th attacks, the U.S. policy was to pressure the Taliban with sanctions and political action. But America had so far refrained from providing direct military assistance to the Northern Alliance. However, leading up to the 9-11 attacks, internal pressure within the White House is already shifting and edging the president closer toward providing weapons to the alliance. Just two days before the terror attacks in the U.S., the Taliban had assassinated Ahmad Shah Massoud, the leader of the alliance, with the aid of al-Qaeda operatives posing as journalists. Wounded in the suicide bombing, Massoud would die on his way to the hospital. The attack would later be seen as an indication that the Taliban feared the U.S. would strike back by directly financing the alliance, and thus sought to fracture it and throw it into chaos just two days before the 9-11 attacks. However, Mohammad Fahim, Massoud's lieutenant, quickly consolidated power and ensured the alliance remained intact. Shortly after the terror attacks against the U.S., President Bush issued his ultimatum, and when refused, initiated a plan to militarily overthrow the Taliban, equating those who harbor terrorists to terrorists themselves. President Bush made the decision that neither the Taliban nor al-Qaeda saw coming. U.S. troops would lead the war against the Taliban themselves. The Bush administration sought UN approval of military action, resulting in UN Security Council Resolution 1368. However, while widely interpreted as an authorization for military action, it technically did not authorize America's invasion of Afghanistan. China, who sits on the Security Council, wished for the US to seek full authorization from the UN, knowing that they could then control US military action by threatening a veto vote. They hoped to leverage their veto power in the Security Council in exchange for manipulating the U.S. to stop supplying weapons and equipment to Taiwan, which the Chinese Communist Party continues to wish to forcefully annex to the mainland to this day. On October 4th, the Taliban began to read the writing on the wall and offered to turn bin Laden over to Pakistan, to be put on trial in an international tribunal that operated in accordance to Islamic Sharia law. The proposal was rejected. Knowing that seeking full authorization for invasion from the UN would jeopardize Taiwan's independence, the US invoked the right to self-defense and UN Resolution 1368 as justification. On October 7, 2001, less than a month after the attacks on the homeland, American combat aircraft launched a blistering assault on Taliban positions. The air attacks were coordinated with an offensive by the Northern Alliance, which was itself working alongside approximately 1,000 American Special Operations Forces and Central Intelligence Agency field operatives. That same day, even as bombs were raining down on their forces, the Taliban contacted the U.S. and offered to try bin Laden in Afghanistan itself, under an Islamic court. Knowing that justice would never be served in what would amount to a sham trial, the U.S. rejected the proposal. Meanwhile, American and British aircraft continued a blistering offensive against Taliban strongholds. Cruise missiles launched from warships in the Arabian Sea flew over Pakistan to strike at military targets inside Afghanistan. On the ground, Northern Alliance forces fighting alongside Green Berets from the 5th Special Forces Group, aircrew from the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and numerous Air Force combat controllers pushed south from their strongholds in the mountains. The American bombing campaign was so fierce that just like in Desert Storm, Taliban forces surrendered or defected en masse. The first major victory of the ground war would come on the 9th of November, when the Taliban stronghold of Mazar-e-Sharif was captured. This allowed US-backed forces to rapidly conquer most of northern Afghanistan. Four days after the capture of Mazar-e-Sharif, Kabul was captured after a surprise Taliban withdrawal from the city. As the pressure mounted, the Taliban in the north of the country were forced into a last-ditch defense in Kunduz. However, under withering air attack, Northern Alliance forces destroyed Taliban defenses and took the city on the 26th of November. A new problem arose as a significant number of Taliban fighters fled across the border and into Pakistan. In the Pakistani tribal areas, the government has very little power and the U.S. hesitated from pursuing and destroying retreating Taliban fighters out of fear of inflaming greater tensions amongst the northern tribes of Pakistan. Wishing to secure Pakistani support for the war, the U.S. also refrained from taking actions that would violate its attempt at cooperation with the government. Unbeknownst for a few more years to the U.S., though, Pakistan was secretly aiding and even equipping the Taliban and other insurgents as they would cross the border into Afghanistan. Their support was spearheaded by Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, which ran a massive effort to arm, feed, and even provide medical care for wounded Taliban and other insurgent fighters. While never verified, it is strongly suspected that Pakistan was also fully aware of the fact that Osama bin Laden was hiding in their territory and likely even assisted efforts to keep him hidden from U.S. sources. Given that bin Laden was discovered hiding in Abbottabad, 
a major city known for its military institutions and often compared to America's West Point, it's incredulous to think that Pakistan was not actively protecting bin Laden from American arrest or assassination. The reason why is simple. The Taliban represented a strong barrier between Pakistan and Iran, as well as helping to limit Western influence in the region. Pakistan had every incentive to keep the Taliban in power and under their influence, and US plans to uproot al-Qaeda directly clashed with what they saw as a national security priority. In the south of the country, Taliban forces retreated to Kandahar. Before the assault on the city began, the Taliban agreed to surrender to the US, a deal which was rejected by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld as a precondition to surrender was that Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar be granted amnesty. This was unacceptable to the United States, who knew that leaving Omar in power would only encourage the Taliban to persist in a future conflict. Thus, the First Battle of Kandahar was on. On the 19th of October, 200 Rangers from the 3rd Ranger Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, landed on a desert landing strip south of the city. There, they linked up with 750 American paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division. The task force immediately set about creating the U.S.'s first base inside Afghanistan, known as Camp Rhino. This would serve as a logistics base to support the Northern Alliance and provide direct combat aid to their forces in the battle to come. Kandahar was heavily defended, and given its dense urban nature would be a difficult city to capture. Defended by fanatical Taliban fighters who knew this was their last stand, the U.S. moved to prepare Northern Alliance forces for the tough fight ahead. On the 18th of November, militia commander Gul Agha Shahzai was contacted by American Special Forces. Under his command, Shahzai had about 800 fighters, but they were severely under-equipped for the task at hand. With Uncle Sam bringing lots of spare toys, Shirzai's militia was soon reinforced with weapons, ammunition, and vehicles. On the 22nd of November, a force of 100 vehicles advanced on Kandahar through the desert. Shirzai attempted to bypass Taliban strongholds ringing the city, but was forced to stop at the Taliban-held town of Taktipur. There he attempted to negotiate a surrender of the outnumbered and outgunned Taliban fighters, but instead was ambushed. American air power held in reserve to directly support Shirzai was immediately called devastating the Taliban ambush. Their forces were put into a full retreat, vacating the city. Meanwhile, the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit arrived at Fab Rhino on November 25th, relieving the 101st Airborne. The 101st was immediately tasked to strike at Taliban positions outside of the city, and two days later, the 15th MEU joined the fight, supported by a unit of Australian Special Air Service operators. Hamid Karzai, leading the Eastern Alliance, had spent several weeks recruiting after the Battle of Tarankwat on November 14th. With about 800 men, Karzai led an attack on Kandahar from the north. On the 30th of November, Karzai's forces took the town of Pita without a fight, but when they attempted to take the bridge at Said Am Kaleh, met with stiff resistance. The United States aided Karzai's forces with two days of heavy airstrikes using precision munitions that left the bridge intact. On the 4th of December, overwhelmed by American air power, Karzai's forces managed to secure the bridge by setting up a beachhead on the other side. Unfortunately, the next day, a stray American bomb would land on a U.S. position, killing three Special Forces soldiers and wounding Karzai. However, Karzai's forces remained cohesive even with their leader wounded and began negotiations with the Taliban for surrender of Kandahar. Meanwhile, Shahzai's forces initiated an assault on Kandahar's airport, but they were surprised to discover little resistance from the Taliban. Unbeknownst to Shahzai, the Taliban had surrendered the city to Karzai, but it was Shahzai at the head of his militia who entered the city and was declared governor of the city. Karzai, meanwhile, did not object as he'd already been declared chairman of the Afghan interim administration, which would work to establish a new democratic government after the fall of the Taliban. By the 9th of December, Kandahar had been fully secured. A group of Al-Qaeda troops under the command of Saif al adel managed to escape into Pakistan. al adel remains on the FBI's top 10 most wanted terrorists to this day and is believed to be hiding out in Iran. As Kandahar was being secured, the United States and its allies launched a massive attack against Al-Qaeda forces in the cave complex of Tora Bora. On December 3rd, 20 CIA National Clandestine Services Special Activities Division operatives, alongside members from the 5th Special Forces Group, were inserted via helicopter into Jalalabad. Codenamed Jawbreaker, the tank force coordinated with the Northern Alliance fighters as they began an assault on the planes leading up to the cave complexes. For 72 hours, Jawbreaker called in a series of non-stop airstrikes on enemy positions, 
forcing them to retreat into more entrenched positions further up the mountains. One week later, 70 special operators from the U.S. Army's Delta Force A Squadron and Air Force Special Tactics Squadron joined Jawbreaker via vehicle. They would lead the ground operation against the Al-Qaeda positions. For their part, Al-Qaeda fighters would light fires at night for warmth and to cook, which allowed U.S. aircraft to launch precision strikes against them. With the aid of U.S., German, and British Special Forces, Northern Alliance fighters made progress into the cave complexes. Al-Qaeda forces contacted a local Afghan commander and negotiated a truce. However, the time requested to surrender their weapons was believed to actually be used to buy time to allow senior Al-Qaeda officials to escape. On the 12th of December, fighting resumed as a rear guard attempted to buy time for Al-Qaeda's main forces to escape into Pakistan. Alliance forces, along with U.S. Special Forces and heavy air support, assaulted heavily fortified Al-Qaeda positions in caves and bunkers, leading the attack against the complex of Tora Bora itself were 13 British Special Forces operators alongside German and American operators. These forces helped secure the flanks of the Alliance assault against Al-Qaeda ambush and were critical in success of the operation. Intent on the complete destruction of Al-Qaeda forces, the U.S. continued a heavy bombing campaign against the cave complexes. A force of 2,000 local militias organized and paid for by U.S. Special Forces and CIA operatives massed for an attack against the complex. By December 17, Al-Qaeda's last stronghold was destroyed, and U.S. Special Forces immediately launched a search for Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden, however, had managed to successfully escape into Pakistan. Later, it was revealed that the CIA officer leading the CIA team on the ground had requested more U.S. forces to directly attack the caves that he believed bin Laden had been trapped inside of. His request was denied by the Bush administration, who believed that even if bin Laden evaded capture, he would be arrested as soon as he entered Pakistan. We know now that bin Laden was likely captured by the Pakistani government, who promptly whisked him into hiding in order to use him as a future bargaining chip. Had the request for additional forces been approved, the war on terror could have ended a decade earlier than it did. After the taking of Kandahar and the destruction of Al-Qaeda's stronghold in Tora Bora, surviving Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces either went to ground or escaped in Pakistan. From the safety of Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas, an insurgency blossomed, which allowed the Taliban to launch repeated assaults against the democratic government taking root in Afghanistan. Without permission from Pakistan to send troops to root out the cancer growing in its tribal areas, the U.S. was forced to rely on drones to surveil the target enemy leadership. These drone strikes drew global condemnation, thanks in no part to the fact that Pakistan's ISI itself fanned the flames of outrage in order to limit U.S. influence. The truth is that casualties from the U.S. drone strikes were self-reported by forces operating in the tribal areas, which did not allow Pakistani government investigators to enter. Thus, casualty figures were never truly verified by anyone other than the very insurgents and terrorists that the U.S. was targeting, and the fact that these individuals don't wear military uniforms allowed them to claim that all the victims, or at least most, were innocent civilians. Al-Qaeda, however, would be destroyed as a global terror organization while the Taliban would bide its time until 2021 when they exploited a U.S. pullout of the nation to topple the weak democratic government. Osama bin Laden is dead. The Al-Qaeda leader had been public enemy number one of the United States and much of the world since he had masterminded a series of terror attacks against the U.S., culminating in the 9-11 attacks. He had avoided capture for 10 years, moving from safe house to safe house, but SEAL Team 6 had tracked him down and gunned him down. The terror mastermind was no more, and his corpse had been conclusively identified. Now there was only one thing left to do, deal with his body. But how do you actually lay a terrorist leader to eternal rest? The United States chose an unusual option, one informed by religion and history. The most efficient choice for dealing with bin Laden's body would have been cremation. The burning process would leave no trace of him, and it would ensure there was no burial place for him to be memorialized. But cremation is illegal in Islam, and bin Laden was a devout Muslim. Despite him being an enemy of the United States, they wanted to respect his faith. This would avoid angering his supporters and potentially causing more retaliation. While the practice of desecrating the bodies of one's enemies was common in ancient times, it was something that was highly frowned upon and beneath the U.S. today. So, why not bury him? There were a lot of issues with that as well. For one thing, a country would need to claim his body. Bin Laden had died in Pakistan, but the Pakistani government denied all knowledge of his activities and certainly wasn't going to claim the body. He spent most of the last 10 years in Afghanistan, but the government there was US-aligned now and actively fighting Bin Laden's supporters. To bring his body there for burial would rile up those terrorists and make the government's job harder. And then there was Bin Laden's country of origin, Saudi Arabia. 
While his initial motivation for becoming a terrorist was to avenge what he thought was the desecration of Saudi Arabia by the presence of US troops, the Saudis disagreed. They had invited those soldiers during the Gulf War and viewed bin Laden as a traitor and a terrorist. So clearly, no one wanted to take him, and burying a monster is always a tricky thing. Throughout history, those laying villains to rest have always had to play a tricky balancing act. When it comes to death row inmates, it's usually up to the family. They can claim the remains and bury them in a family plot, but it's possible that family members of the victim might come and disrupt their mourning. When Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh was executed, people realized the mad veteran might actually be allowed to be buried in Arlington, until Congress passed a law banning anyone convicted of a capital crime from a military funeral. McVeigh's body was cremated, and many either meet the same end or are buried in prison cemeteries. But some notorious killers, including Ed Gein and Bonnie Parker, do have graves around the US. But bin Laden wasn't just a killer. When a historic villain has a movement behind them or even a nation, what happens to their body can be a matter of national security. When Abraham Lincoln's assassin John Wilkes Booth was gunned down, his body was initially taken into federal custody and held there for identification for an extended period. No doubt the government would have preferred to keep it there, but the Booth family was a powerful acting clan with influence, and eventually they were able to collect the body and take it home to the family plot in Baltimore. There he was buried alongside a small ceremony full of loyalists. While Maryland stayed in the Union, there were a lot of Confederate sympathizers there, and many no doubt saw Booth as a hero. While the Booth plot is still standing, John Wilkes Booth has only a small unmarked gravestone there. And he wasn't the only infamous figure to get sent off in this style. Francisco Franco was an outlier when it came to the fascist dictators of World War II. He had stayed out of the Axis alliance, and he was able to stay leader of Spain for decades. Even today, many survivors of his reign speak fondly of him. After all, they didn't experience anything bad, because they kept their heads down and didn't criticize him. And those who were targeted by him, well, most of them aren't around to talk about it. So, when he died in 1975, he was given a state funeral and a prominent place in a mausoleum in the Valley of the Fallen, a massive monument built by Franco. This gave him a place of honor in the country and was a source of massive controversy until the government exhumed him in 2019, taking his remains to a smaller cemetery where his wife was buried. And he wasn't the only World War II era leader who continued causing chaos after his death. So how do you memorialize a man who killed millions? Well, if that man was Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, you hold him up as a hero of the revolution. And give them a massive state funeral. After Stalin's death from illness in 1953, he was laid to rest in Lenin's mausoleum and was memorialized by the top figures in the Soviet Union. A massive crowd gathered to pay their respects, and this caused a massive stampeding incident where hundreds of people died. Stalin's body would eventually be moved to the Kremlin Wall Necropolis, the Soviet Union's biggest memorial, until his successor Nikita Khrushchev eventually had him removed as part of his campaign of de-Stalinization. But in one case, the Soviets decided the best solution was no solution. Everyone knows Adolf Hitler met his end in a Berlin bunker before he could be arrested by the Allies. But what happened next? No one knows conclusively. We do know that the Soviets swept in, took over the bunker, and then Hitler's body was never seen again. The consensus is that the body was destroyed, but speculation over what happened persisted for decades, with even the Soviets commissioning reports on whether he could have survived. The ambiguity led to many problems, including false reports of Hitler sightings, but everyone agreed it was probably better than burying the Nazi dictator and letting neo-Nazis have a memorial site to rally to. And in one case, the controversy over a dictator's burial place spiraled completely out of control. The the monarchy in England was all but absolute in the 1600s, until Oliver Cromwell came along. The powerful English general staged a successful coup against King Charles I, leading to the king's execution, after which he ruled as Lord Protector until his death. Under his tenure, he waged an aggressive foreign policy and persecuted Roman Catholics. His death led to a power vacuum which eventually led to the royalists returning to power, and the son of King Cromwell returned to the throne. One of his first acts was to order Cromwell's body removed from its tomb. He held a mock execution, beheaded the corpse, and the head of Cromwell was displayed on a pike and passed around for hundreds of years. So it's no wonder that the US wanted to be very careful about how to handle bin Laden's body. Cremation was out, and so was a proper burial. An anonymous unmarked burial was likely discussed, but if word got out, it would cause chaos. So the decision was made to bury him at sea, with enough precautions to make sure no one could ever find or recover his body. But this wouldn't be any normal sea burial. Islamic tradition requires a body to be buried within 24 hours of death, so the US moved quickly as soon as his body was identified. They took pictures and conclusively identified him, and then transferred the body aboard the USS Carl Vinson. They then conducted Islamic burial rites, washing his body, wrapping him in a white cloth, and 
even bringing in an Arabic translator to provide religious rites, but they weren't going to be taking any chances. After Bin Laden's body was fully shrouded and all the religious rites were over, it was draped in hundreds of pounds of iron chains and then loaded onto a wooden board. The board was pushed forward to the edge of the boat, tilted forward, and the terror leader's body slipped into the water, never to be seen again. Not only did this ensure Osama Bin Laden would not have a grave that could become a shrine for extremists, but it guaranteed that no one would ever be able to find and recover his body. So this was probably a satisfactory solution for everyone, right? Not so much. Burial at sea isn't considered an appropriate Islamic rite if other options are available, and whether other options were available depends on your perspective. Some said the US should have let Bin Laden be buried in one of his many home bases, while others felt he didn't deserve the respect that he was given with a burial at sea. Along with the controversy over how he was eliminated by the Navy SEALs, this would linger for years, but no one would be really able to do anything about it because Osama Bin Laden's body was miles below the ocean surface. From video games to Disney movies to livestock to anime, we're about to take you on a crash course to some of the craziest things the Navy SEALs found inside Bin Laden's compound after he was shot dead. First, the surprising, before we work on our way up to the truly weird. Emails and extensive diaries were found on Bin Laden's computer showing that contrary to popular belief, Bin Laden still had a lot more influence and control over Al-Qaeda than anyone believed. He communicated with the group extensively through thousands of written correspondences, issuing everything from strategic commands to religious fatwas. Bin Laden didn't have an internet connection at the compound, so couriers would instead take his written emails on a flash drive and send them out from a local internet cafe. And that's sure to get a laugh out of anyone who knows anything about cybersecurity. We can only hope he was at least using a VPN. Other deeply personal things soon became CIA property after the raid, including Bin Laden's personal diary and the wedding videos of his son, Hamza. Incidentally, the wedding video actually had great strategic importance to US intelligence. It was widely believed that Hamza was being groomed to take his old man's place at the seat of the Al-Qaeda table, but they hadn't received any photos of him since he was a child. Until now. This was presumably pretty useful intelligence as Hamza bin Laden was killed by US forces in Afghanistan between 2017 and 2019. Okay, so that's all the serious stuff out of the way. Now, let's get strange. Did you know bin Laden was very possibly a gamer? While we can't ever know who was playing or watching what on the Al-Qaeda leader's computer, he was cooped up for a half a decade and had a multitude of video games on his PC. <laughs> it's more than likely he used some of his favorite video games to blow off some steam. So what kind of games did this architect of terror like to indulge in? A big one was Counter-Strike, the iconic multiplayer game where two teams play as either terrorist or counter-terrorist groups in conflict with one another. We can only wonder which team he preferred to play as, whether he continued to do what he did best online, or if he decided to play as the counter-terrorists instead for a little escapism. He also had a pirated copy of Half-Life on his computer, and there's a kind of satisfaction in knowing that he died before he ever got a chance to play Half-Life Alex. He also had Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars, the puzzle game Zuma Deluxe, and Sniper Elite Nazi Zombie Army 2, because we guess even Bin Laden doesn't approve of Nazis. But he wasn't just a PC gamer, Bin Laden also apparently loved a good emulated Nintendo DS game, because he had a whole bunch of them. These included classics like Super Mario Bros. and Animal Crossing Wild World. Incidentally, he didn't pay for official releases of any of these games. The man truly was a monster. But wait, it gets weirder. Without going into too much detail, Bin Laden's computer had a vast number of graphic screen caps from 8-bit Japanese adult games from the late 1990s. His computer also contained such classy file names as, no, we're not kidding, booby2.jpg and horsedance.flv. It must have been a very long five years. Incidentally, Osama bin Laden must have been an otaku, the Japanese expression for someone who's incredibly enthusiastic about niche topics, more commonly used in the West to describe someone heavily invested in Japanese culture and media. Bin Laden had a vast collection of anime on his computer, including Dragon Ball, Detective Conan, Bleach, and a little-known anime adaptation of the Devil May Cry game series. Incidentally, he also had a Dragon Ball video game as well as Final Fantasy VII. Doesn't quite seem like a hobby befitting of a man who had the top spot on the FBI's most wanted list for years on end. But enough about Japanese media. For a guy who despised the West as much as Bin Laden, surely we couldn't expect him to indulge in anything as corrupt and sinful as Western TV and movies, right? Not quite, as it turns out. Bin Laden actually had a vast number of Western movies and TV shows, particularly cartoons. These included Cars, Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, Chicken Little, and Ants. There's a real irony in a man as anti-Semitic as Osama Bin Laden owning a Woody Allen movie about talking cartoon ants. Because he probably needed a laugh during his five years of de facto house arrest, he also kept several episodes of the cartoon Tom and Jerry on his computer, as well as an episode of Mr. Bean. 
He also had the movie adaptation of Resident Evil, which has made a number of viewers wish a team of Navy SEALs would storm in and shoot them. But he wasn't all about the fiction. Like many of you fine intellectually curious infographics fans, he was also a lover of documentaries. These included Mysteries of Egypt, Sex Crimes and the Vatican, BBC Battlefields, and Welcome to the 11th Dimension, the final part of Nova's Elegant Universe series, a surprising pick for a hardline religious fundamentalist. But without a doubt, Bin Laden's favorite documentary topic was himself. That's right, Bin Laden had a large number of documentaries about himself and his crimes, including Biography, Osama Bin Laden and Where in the World is Osama Bin Laden. These presumably gave him a little bit of self-esteem boost whenever the isolation was getting too much for him. In the interest of balance, he also owned a copy of Loose Change 2, the 9-11 truther documentary created by Alex Jones, suggesting the attack was an inside job. We can only assume Bin Laden thought of this one as a dark comedy. But looking at screens for all those years can really mess with your eyes. What about when one of the most evil men on earth just wants to kick back and read a book for a little while? Bin Laden had a pretty vast and varied library, including books on American diplomatic and foreign policy, including Noam Chomsky's Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, and Bob Woodward's Obama's Wars. He was also a big fan of books on conspiracy theories, such as the Illuminati and of course, 9-11 conspiracy theories. He truly was the has-been one-hit wonder of infamous international criminals. And finally, some of the things on Bin Laden's computer that were so odd they defy other categories. Internet videos, pictures, and of course memes. We're talking ancient memes too. He had saved a copy of Charlie Bit My Finger, the popular viral video from 2007, a respectable collection of funny and cute cat videos, and even an adorable picture of a stuffed monkey. He also had a weirdly high number of crochet guide videos, including a guide to crocheting an iPod sock. It's almost surreal to think that Bin Laden had these goofy videos on the same hard drive as footage of Al-Qaeda beheadings. Bin Laden had a lot of saved YouTube videos on his computer before his death. Thankfully, because we started making videos only a few months before his death back in 2011, there was nothing from the infographic show on that deeply cursed hard drive. And finally, one of the strangest things of all on Bin Laden's computer, his press release bloopers. You might remember the sinister videos of Bin Laden sharing his ideologies and threats against the West on VHS tapes, normally sitting in a cave and flanked by his Al-Qaeda henchmen. But while in the Abbottabad compound, Bin Laden filmed a number of practice videos that never ended up getting released to the public, serving almost as a kind of Al-Qaeda blooper reel from the master of terror himself. Personally, we can't imagine it'll be finding its way onto America's Funniest Home Videos anytime soon. And that's all you need to know about the strangest things the Navy SEALs found in the Abbottabad compound. Good riddance, Bin Laden. We're sure they have a copy of Chicken Little in hell. Osama Bin Laden went down in history for his obsession with attacking the United States and its allies, never giving up on his mad quest until he was finally gunned down by SEAL Team 6 in 2011. But why was this terrorist mastermind so obsessed with the United States? Why did he attack the US in the first place? If you ask many intellectuals, they'll tell you that most terrorists aren't powerful criminals, but rather people driven by desperation to strike out against a government they view as oppressing them. This applied to many of Bin Laden's henchmen, who were sponsored by Al-Qaeda's inner circle to train in its terror camps. But it did not apply to Osama Bin Laden. Osama grew up in Saudi Arabia in the lap of luxury, as the son of Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden. To say that the elder bin Laden was a success would be putting it lightly. He was a billionaire construction magnate who ensured his family was well taken care of, his very large family at that. Osama bin Laden was born in 1957 as a son of Mohammed bin Laden's 10th wife. In total, his father had 52 children. His mother divorced the billionaire soon after Osama was born, but Osama would ultimately inherit at least $25 million from his father. So, he was well taken care of. But where did his radicalism begin? The Bin Laden family was devoutly religious, but followed a mainstream version of the Sunni Muslim faith. They were well assimilated into Saudi culture, and no one would expect one of the clan to become an infamous terrorist. He didn't follow a career path that would lead to extremism either. If you knew him back in the 70s, you would have known him as a mild-mannered economics and business student in King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. He graduated, although reports vary on what he majored in. But we do know he briefly attended a class at Oxford. Those who knew him reported he was passionate about poetry, military history, and soccer. So how did it all go so horribly wrong? It all started when he left college in 1979 and he went to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviet Union. 
The invasion of Afghanistan had galvanized him to become a political radical, but he had no reason to hate the United States at that point. In fact, the US and the Soviet Union were bitter enemies. The groups he worked with, like the Mujahideen, had even received financial support from the United States as they battled to the hold the Soviets at bay. The Saudis provided support against the Soviets as well, and it seemed like bin Laden's interests were well in line with those of the larger Western countries. But then, something changed. By the time Osama bin Laden became a public name in the West due to a series of escalating terror attacks against US interests, his motivations had dramatically changed, and so had his status in the world. His turn to anti-West radicalism had led to his Saudi citizenship being revoked. After all, the Saudis greatly valued their alliance with the United States, particularly due to their rivalry with Iran, and they didn't want to be associated with a wild card. Bin Laden found himself a stateless terrorist, finding refuge in countries like Sudan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and he would only surface occasionally to make threatening videotapes. And on these videotapes, his motivation started to become clearer. What turned the son of a Saudi billionaire construction magnate into a terrorist radical? Bin Laden gave many explanations, and not all of them really matched up. Not long after the 9-11 attacks, Bin Laden released his first new videotape taking credit for the attacks, and he singled out one main reason for the attack. This was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which had been raging for over 50 years at that point. If you ask the Israelis, they had fended off a genocidal war of invasion against a newborn country and taken the territory they needed to defend themselves. If you ask the Palestinians or the surrounding Arab states, they had been expelled from their territory by newcomers to the region and had been fighting to get their lands back ever since. But was this regional conflict enough to create a global war? In a word, probably not. While the Israeli-Palestinian conflict always makes emotions run high, just ask anyone in the comments section in an article about Gal Gadot, it was also a relatively small-scale conflict. The conflict over the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Jewish Temple Mount was likely the most concerning to a religious zealot like bin Laden, but there was one problem with the idea that this was his motivation. Prior to this video, he had never mentioned the conflict before. The odds are that after striking his biggest blow yet against the US and becoming public enemy number one, he was hoping that bringing up this hot topic would get him more support from the countries in the region. But other conflicts may have had more to do with his radicalization. The Gulf War was one of the largest conflicts of the 1990s, with the United States ultimately stopping Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, but leaving the Iraqi dictator in power. Saddam was infamous for his brutal treatment of minority groups like the Kurds and frequently attacked US planes entering his airspace. Iraqi forces even attempted to assassinate former President George H.W. Bush shortly after he left office, so the UN imposed sanctions on Iraq as long as Saddam refused to cooperate with international authorities, and this led to a trade embargo and widespread suffering in Iraq. And that was enough to get bin Laden deeply angry. He first mentioned the sanctions in his 1998 fatwa against Americans, claiming that over a million Iraqis had been killed by the sanctions and saying that targeting civilians was permissible due to this carnage. But bin Laden had no direct ties to the Iraqis and had never fought in the country and, in fact, Saddam was a very different sort of radical to him. Saddam led a military dictatorship that had no real alliance with Islamic radical groups, and when he was deposed by the United States a few years later, it created an opening for Al-Qaeda in the country. So bin Laden basing his entire worldview around this issue would seem unlikely. But other conflicts were on his radar as well. Bin Laden's manifesto also mentioned countless conflicts regarding Muslims in the world. They included Russia's oppression of the Chechen Muslim minority in the Soviet Union the ongoing border conflict in Kashmir between Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan, the Philippine government's conflict with Muslim groups, and Israel's ongoing northern border conflict with Lebanon. In each of these cases, bin Laden said the United States was aiding these groups to oppress Muslims. There was just one problem with that. The US had little to nothing to do with any of these conflicts. While they were allies with some of the countries, the government had little to do with them. In Russia's assault on Chechnya, the US had frosty relationships with its geopolitical rival, at best, even after the fall of the Soviet Union. The one exception was bin Laden's mention of the conflict in Somalia, where US involvement led to a bloody conflict that was immortalized in the movie Black Hawk Down. But none of these conflicts were particularly close to bin Laden, and his inclusion of them started to look more like a list of grievances than a smoking gun. He had one complaint that didn't match the others though, and this one might have had some right-wing Americans nodding along. In his 2002 Letter to America, his first time communicating with the outside world after the 9-11 attacks, 
He decided to broaden his complaints to America's domestic conduct, but he didn't accuse them of oppressing Muslim Americans. Instead, he went on a rant about America's immorality. Some of his complaints included the country's support of promiscuous sex, gay rights, alcohol and drugs, and gambling. He also oddly complained about trading with interest prohibited in Islam, but something common in banking around the world. Was Osama bin Laden suddenly becoming a culture critic? While many anti-American radicals do criticize America's domestic policies in addition to its foreign policies, while not being fully-fledged terrorists, this appears to be another case like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where bin Laden seemed to generate a new grievance after the attacks that put him on the world stage. It's unlikely that this was his primary grievance that motivated the attacks, but a savvy propagandist like bin Laden might have put it in the manifesto to set Americans against each other. After all, if right-wing Americans start blaming the gay rights movement for terror attacks, maybe they'll be too busy fighting with each other to find him. But most experts believe one factor motivated him more than any other. The year was 1991 and Saddam Hussein had invaded the oil-rich Persian Gulf state of Kuwait. Even though we've already discovered that Saddam Hussein didn't fully support bin Laden's cause, the roots of his rage might be tied to the war anyway. The US and Saudi Arabia were closely aligned, and the Saudis quickly invited US troops onto their soil to launch their attacks on Iraq from there, and to provide some insurance in case Saddam decided to take his quest for oil even further. And when the war ended, the US stuck around. From 1992 to 2003, the US had around 5,000 troops stationed in Saudi Arabia, mostly to conduct air operations over Iraq. While Saddam had been pushed back, there had never been any formal peace agreement and he continued to behave aggressively toward his neighbors. This was something the Saudis agreed to and in fact invited. Their security was endangered by Saddam as well, and business relations with the US were important to both countries. The US presence was vital to protecting the shipping lanes of the Persian Gulf. So, why did this fill bin Laden with rage? Simple, the US agreed, the Saudis agreed, but no one asked him. While most people involved felt that the security benefits were worth it, Osama bin Laden viewed even the voluntary presence of US troops on Saudi soil as an invasion of holy Muslim land. While the troops were nowhere near the sacred cities of Mecca and Medina, they were too close for this radical. And there is ample evidence that this might have been the trigger that turned him into an anti-American militant. For one thing, it was the only motivation mentioned in the very first fatwa he issued in 1996, demanding the US evacuate Saudi Arabia. Two years later, he referred to it as an invasion, in which the United States had been plundering the country and humiliating the people. He believed it was a staging ground for an assault on the entire Muslim world, and repeatedly accused the Americans of being too close to Mecca. The US presence in Saudi Arabia would eventually end when the second war with Iraq began due to the Saudis opposing that conflict, but this was the only motivation that bin Laden kept coming back to. Which means, ironically, Osama bin Laden's reason for wanting to declare war on America might have been that his home country invited them in to protect them from a hostile neighbor. Of course, if you ask 10 people why Osama bin Laden hated America, you'll probably get 10 answers, and most of them will reflect on the person's opinions more than the truth. Osama bin Laden was an awful person who did terrible things. Therefore, it should come as no surprise when the CIA examined the hard drives recovered from his compound, they found awful things. When they dug deeper into what was actually on the hard drives, some surprising files were discovered. We now know Osama bin Laden was watching anime, playing video games, and exploring some of the more unsavory aspects of the internet. Get ready, because what you're about to discover on this terrorist's hard drive will shock and appall you. On May 2, 2011, a group of Navy SEALs infiltrated Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. During this heroic mission, five terrorists, including bin Laden himself and one of his sons, were killed. The Special Forces unit moved through the compound with precision, ensuring that even after they killed bin Laden, they extracted his body so it could be thrown into the ocean at a later date. This was done to keep fanatics from worshipping it. During this mission, the SEAL team secured several hard drives, flash drives, and computers that contained some pretty crazy things. The CIA released a large amount of the hard drive's contents to further enhance public understanding of Al-Qaeda. However, what the average person wasn't expecting was the enormous number of meme videos, crocheting tutorials, and odd pornographic choices that were contained on Osama bin Laden's hard drives. That being said, not everything was released to the public, as there were files used to locate other terrorist leaders and videos too gruesome to circulate to the public. All in all, around 470,000 digital files, amounting to 250 gigabytes of data, were secured from Osama bin Laden's hard drives, and each file was more surprising than the last. Obviously, you'd expect to find terrorist-related information on a terrorist's hard drive, 
And although the CIA likely didn't release most of the documentation relating to Al-Qaeda's plans and activities, they did release something pretty interesting. One of the documents on the hard drives was an Al-Qaeda recruitment form. This might seem odd. When you think of recruitment forms, you probably have a business or not-for-profit in mind, but it would seem that Al-Qaeda needed some kind of document to vet their recruits. However, unlike a traditional recruitment form, the questions found on Al-Qaeda's equivalent were unique to their line of work. Questions like, do you wish to execute a suicide operation, were included in the application, along with less blunt questions like, what are your favorite hobbies or pastimes? It's unclear if the answers to these questions either qualified or disqualified a candidate from becoming a terrorist, but this is just one of the many documents that give us a glimpse into Al-Qaeda's vetting process and how the organization was run. Other terrorist-related information on the hard drives included videos and speeches of Osama's son, Hamza bin Laden. It was assumed that Hamza would take over the organization when his father either passed away or could no longer lead Al-Qaeda, so documentary footage was archived on the hard drives for historical purposes. Al-Qaeda also used these videos and images as propaganda to show Hamza would be a strong leader. However, the videos on the hard drives seemed to contradict the message. There was an hour-long wedding video on one of the hard drives, which droned on and on and seemed to have no real significance. Hamza is seen sporting a thin mustache and looking relatively unhappy throughout the whole thing. Images from the wedding were also used in some of the terrorist group's propaganda, but the footage was cut to portray Hamza in a positive light. Some of the images and videos on the hard drives were likely used to identify and locate Hamza. In 2019, Hamza was killed in a U.S. counterterrorism operation somewhere in Afghanistan or Pakistan. The hard drives also consisted of plans and preparations for the 10th anniversary of September 11th and ways to use the Arab Spring uprisings to Al-Qaeda's advantage. The information on Osama bin Laden's hard drives was not meant to be seen by anyone outside of Al-Qaeda, as they included details that would allow the U.S. to interrupt their plans. However, it's the things other than terrorist plots and speeches found on the hard drives that were the most shocking. It probably comes as no surprise that Osama bin Laden was a narcissist. His hard drive tells this story almost perfectly. This awful human loved documentaries about himself. In fact, his hard drives were loaded with shows such as CNN's In the Footsteps of Bin Laden and World's Most Wanted. It's plausible that these shows were downloaded just to keep tabs on what the US media knew about him, but there was also no reason to save the files after they were watched if that was the only thing they were being used for. It's not hard to imagine Osama bin Laden watching documentaries about himself and finding pleasure in them. This is a disgusting thought, but bin Laden was a disgusting man. He also had recordings of the 2008 documentary Where in the World is Osama bin Laden created by Morgan Spurlock, the man who made Supersize Me. Perhaps the craziest documentary that Osama bin Laden had on his hard drive was Loose Change, which theorized that the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon was a false flag operation. The documentary has been debunked countless times and has no real evidence or validity to it. It's just odd that Osama bin Laden, the man who orchestrated the 9-11 attacks, would have a copy of this particular documentary on his hard drive. Maybe it was just a reminder of how gullible some people can be, or perhaps he kept it as a memento, just like all the other documentaries about him. We know bin Laden was crazy and super paranoid, and rightfully so, as he had the world's most powerful military looking for him constantly. However, a document on his hard drive showed just how nervous he was about being tracked down. In one folder, there were a set of messages from bin Laden to one of his wives. In it, he told the wife they'd put a tracking device in her filling when she went to a dentist in Iran. Osama described it as the size of the chip is about the length of a grain of wheat and the width of a fine piece of vermicelli. It's not entirely clear what bin Laden did about this paranoid delusion, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that he forced his wife to have the tooth removed. There's also no evidence that a tracking device was ever put into her tooth or if this was even possible at the time. As we go deeper into the hard drives of Osama bin Laden, things start to get stranger and stranger. For example, some of the porn he had on it wasn't the most conventional. Osama bin Laden was into some kinky stuff. On his hard drive were bootleg copies of obscure porn titles that came from old arcade games. For example, games like Fantasy 95 or Perestroika Girls rewarded players who progressed through the story with badly drawn pictures of naked or scantily clad anime women. These pictures were either pixelated characters or extremely low resolution pictures of real nude women. It seems like an odd choice for porn. However, it wouldn't be uncharacteristic for Osama bin Laden to have strange tastes when it came to what interested him. That being said, some journalists believe that the pixelated porn might have been used to send coded messages to other members of Al-Qaeda. 
Bin Laden was afraid of relaying messages via email as they might be tracked back to him. This was also probably not the most secure way of sending messages to his terrorist organization, especially if he didn't want the US to find out what his plans were. Therefore, it's hypothesized that he might have hidden secret orders or messages within the pornographic images or games that he had on his drive. But some experts have another hypothesis as to why Bin Laden had so much pixelated porn on his hard drive. They say he might have just been into it. Osama Bin Laden wasn't only into watching porn, there were also many other surprising videos, shows, and movies that were discovered on his hard drives. Think back to around 2007 and the meme videos that came out on YouTube. Perhaps the most famous of all was Charlie Bit My Finger. <laughs> Charlie. Charlie bit me. Ah. It was so popular that even Osama Bin Laden saw it. When going through the files on his hard drives, the CIA was surprised to find that Bin Laden had downloaded a lot of YouTube videos and even enjoyed watching the meme videos that were coming out of the US. There were numerous cat videos found on the hard drive, which might suggest that Bin Laden was a cat person, or at least he found them amusing. One of the most surprising assortments of videos that Bin Laden downloaded off the internet had nothing to do with terrorism or memes. Instead, he had a huge collection of crocheting videos. This might seem weird for a mass murderer and a leader of a terrorist organization, but when Bin Laden was in hiding, there probably wasn't a whole lot to do. He might have taken up crocheting as a hobby and learned how to do various patterns using YouTube videos. For example, files like How to Crochet a Basket, Stripe Crochet Beanie Cap Hat, and Star Rainbow Crochet Applique were some of the numerous crocheting files found on Bin Laden's hard drive. We aren't sure if he was the one doing all the crocheting, but someone in Al-Qaeda had a real interest in knitting. The other part about the videos on Osama Bin Laden's hard drive was that there were a number of educational videos for young children. Maybe these are what Bin Laden used to learn English. Files like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, The New Fast Alphabet, ABC Phonics Chant, and One Two Buckle My Shoe suggest that Bin Laden struggled with his ABCs. In all fairness, the Arabic alphabet is different than the Latin alphabet, but the videos he chose to learn the ABCs from probably didn't have to be children's sing-along songs. Bin Laden also liked other documentaries besides just the ones that were about him. Yet, like everything else on his hard drive, there seemed to be some odd choices. Perhaps Osama Bin Laden was looking for dirt on the Christian church, or maybe he just found scandals fascinating. But one of the many documentaries was Sex, Crimes, and the Vatican. Another file was titled How Many Angels Are There?, which could refer to a documentary about how many angels there are in heaven, or perhaps this was just a YouTube video that literally explained how many angels there were in the Quran or other holy writings. Osama Bin Laden also enjoyed his cartoons. There were several episodes of Tom and Jerry along with the Pink Panther found on the hard drive, but perhaps the most intriguing video file of all is one that's titled Bubbles.WMV. Is this just a video of someone blowing bubbles? Is it about how to make bubbles? Or is it something else entirely? We may never know. There also appears to be a lot of anime fans at Osama Bin Laden's compound. Because the large amounts of space on the hard drives was dedicated to anime shows. It might be hard to imagine Osama Bin Laden and his terrorist friends sitting around watching anime, but the sheer number of videos on the hard drive suggests this is exactly what happened. Osama enjoyed Naruto, Bleach, and Dragon Ball Z. On top of that, there was also The Devil May Cry and a number of anime crossovers that only hardcore anime fans even knew existed. It's actually impressive how vast of an anime collection Osama Bin Laden had on his drives. This also goes to show just how much pirating of copyrighted materials Al-Qaeda did. Copyright infringement probably isn't the most pressing concern for a terrorist organization, but it does mean someone in Al-Qaeda put a lot of time and effort into illegally procuring all of the anime videos, along with some other digital content. We'll never know if this was at the order of Osama Bin Laden, or if someone else in the organization took it upon themselves to load up the hard drives with anime, but the massive amount of files suggests it was likely being watched regularly. For someone who hated the Western world so much, Bin Laden had a lot of Hollywood blockbusters on his hard drive. Animated movies like Ants, Cars, Ice Age, and Chicken Little were all found on the hard drives, but these weren't the only movies found. It would seem Osama and his crew were also into action flicks. The hard drives had files for Resident Evil, The Three Musketeers, and Batman Gotham Knight. Perhaps these were for research purposes, but it seems much more likely that Osama bin Laden and the terrorists that surrounded him just enjoyed watching the flicks that came from a part of the world they saw as the enemy. To be fair, there wasn't a whole lot to do in the compound while hiding from drones and US operatives that were hunting them down. Therefore, bin Laden needed a large number of entertainment options to keep himself busy. And what better way is there to kill the time than by playing hours upon hours of video games? It would seem Osama had a liking for Nintendo games. There were several emulators stored on the hard drives collected from the compound. 
and most of the files associated with them were for classic Nintendo DS games like Mario & Luigi Partners in Time, New Super Mario Bros., Metroid Prime Hunters, and Yoshi's Island DS. However, not all of the video games were based around Nintendo's fun-loving plumber and his friends, there was also a hardcore gamer side to things as well. Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars was another game on Osama's drive. Like with the DS games, there was an emulator installed for Bin Laden to play to his heart's content. The Grand Theft Auto franchise seems much more in line with Osama Bin Laden's personality, since he could kill innocent civilians and cause mayhem. You can imagine him playing until the wee hours of the night, trying to get away from the cops and wreaking havoc across Chinatown. Luckily, he wasn't able to get rid of his wanted status in the real world, and SEAL Team 6 took him out to ensure he'd never hurt anyone ever again. Just like Grand Theft Auto, another game on Osama's hard drives makes sense when you think about it. Members of Al-Qaeda and their leader had access to Counter-Strike, a first-person shooter where players work together either as terrorists trying to plant a bomb or counter-terrorist forces trying to stop them. We'll give you one guess which team Osama and his friends like to play on. The game normally requires an internet connection to play against other people across the world. However, Bin Laden and the crew at the compound may have set up their own LAN network to play against one another. Again, it's probably pretty obvious which side Al-Qaeda members wanted to be on. The LAN network would have been more secure, so they couldn't be traced. Which means if you ever played Counter-Strike back in the day, you probably didn't face off against Osama or members of Al-Qaeda. Although, we don't know that for sure. On top of the video games already mentioned, there seems to be a decent amount of time spent playing Zuma Deluxe to pass the time. You have to remember that around 2007, these types of games were all the rage. It's interesting to note that Osama and his group at the compound seemed pretty up to date with their gaming practices. These men also spent their time killing zombies in Sniper Elite Nazi Zombie Army 2. Many of the video games that Osama and the men in Al-Qaeda were playing had a shooting component to them. Again, this is not surprising considering who was doing the gaming. Even though these were bloodthirsty terrorists, it does seem they enjoyed Nintendo just as much as any of the shooters they had at their disposal. Again, we'll never know which games Osama bin Laden himself preferred or played, but according to the files on his hard drive, he seemed to be an avid gamer. Along with video games, porn, and other media, there was a plethora of documents housed on the hard drives. The important ones were never released to the public for national security reasons. However, we can assume that some of the files on the hard drives led to the capture or deaths of many other Al-Qaeda members. Also, it's likely that not too many photos and videos of torture victims and executions were released to the public. Let's not forget Osama bin Laden and the members of Al-Qaeda were terrible people, capable of unspeakable things. Even though you might have seen some of the videos or played some of the games on Osama's hard drive, it does not mean Bin Laden was an average guy. He was a terrorist responsible for the deaths of thousands, making him more a monster than human. There were also drafts of emails found on Osama Bin Laden's hard drives that provided glimpses into what he had been up to during his years in hiding. He couldn't send emails or make phone calls from the compound because they likely would have been intercepted by US intelligence and given away his position. Therefore, Bin Laden wrote emails that were uploaded to flash drives and brought by a courier to different internet cafes to be emailed out. The most surprising finding from these emails was that even while in hiding, Osama Bin Laden still ran Al-Qaeda. Although he remained its figurehead while in hiding, he did need to give up some of his power to his second-in-command, Ayman al-Zawari. The files recovered from Osama bin Laden's hard drives indicated that he was still giving orders, being briefed on reports, and making religious rulings within the terrorist organization, all while in isolation at his compound. SEAL Team 6 recovered a lot of information during their raid on the compound while simultaneously taking Osama bin Laden out. We don't know how many people were actually living there, but it's reported that at least a few of his wives and several children were at the compound at the time of the operation. This brings us to an important point. Even though these hard drives collected from the compound likely had files that Osama used at some point, these devices could also have been used by other members of the family or by the soldiers staying at the compound with him. Therefore, all the movies, shows, video games, and porn might not have belonged specifically to Osama bin Laden. However, no matter which way you look at it, he almost certainly knew what was on the hard drives, and it's probable that most of the entertainment on the hard drives was for his own amusement and to keep himself busy. Not everything was digital at the compound either. Osama also had an interesting collection of books that gave further insight into how the maniac's mind worked. Surprisingly, Osama bin Laden was the owner of several books on the US. He had an interest in United States diplomacy tactics, which was made apparent by the books such as Bob Woodward's Obama's Wars, Noam Chomsky's Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies, and Robert Hopkins Miller's The US and Vietnam 1787-1941. to 
These readings were likely used to help Bin Laden understand his enemy and plot new ways to terrorize the free world. However, this begs the question, if Osama Bin Laden was so against the United States and the Western world, why did he have so much media from those cultures on his drives? Why weren't the hard drives filled with movies, shows, and games from other parts of the world or even from the Middle East itself? It makes you wonder if consuming Western media was actually a way for Osama bin Laden to understand his enemy better, or if he had all these things on his hard drives because he actually enjoyed watching Chicken Little or YouTube meme videos like Charlie Bit My Finger. It's probably not worth anyone's time to try to understand the man that was Osama bin Laden. To get inside his mind would likely be walking into a nightmare filled with contradictions and atrocities. Instead, we can accept the fact that one of the worst men who ever lived enjoyed pixelated porn and crocheting. Like many evil individuals throughout history, Osama bin Laden had an eccentric side to him. He was definitely a narcissistic psychopath, but he couldn't help but consume American culture even though he hated it. The bottom line is that many of the things you'd expect to find on a terrorist hard drive were there, but many things you wouldn't expect to find on a terrorist hard drive were also there. Either way, the world's a better place without Osama bin Laden in it. Thank you, SEAL Team 6. 1979 Soviet forces invade Afghanistan. The national communist government has been under threat of civil war and open rebellion after taking extremely harsh measures against political opponents, religious figures, and intellectual elites. The Kalak faction has been attempting to completely reform Afghanistan as quickly as possible, discarding old Islamic traditions and angering powerful landowners with the cancellation of farmers' debts. However, it was the assault on traditional Islamic values that triggered an open revolt, and the Soviets feared what might happen if the pro-communist government collapsed. Osama bin Laden, the son of wealthy Saudi Arabian elites, heads for the country to fight against the communist invaders. He sees the war as a holy one, pitting faithful Muslims against the atheist communists. Bin Laden proved adept at organizing various Mujahideen groups and was instrumental in resisting Soviet occupation forces. The United States and various partners funnel money and weapons into Afghanistan via Pakistan. However, despite concerns by various military and political figures, there's little to no oversight of where financial and military aid goes, with little thought given to what group might be left in power after the end of the war, and how they might view the United States and its allies if they won. While there's never been evidence of direct aid to bin Laden and his extremist fighters, accountability is so low it's impossible to rule that possibility out, and it seems the US looked favorably upon the up-and-coming international pariah with papers allegedly writing very positive articles about him during this time. 1988 Bin Laden and other Afghan and Arab leaders come to loggerheads over the role of Arabs within the resistance movement. Abdullah Azam, head of Maktab al-Kindamat, later known as the Afghan Service Bureau, insists that Arab volunteers be integrated into Afghan militias. Bin Laden disagrees and wishes to keep his Arab fighters separate from Afghan nationals. He also wishes to pursue a more military role. The split leads to the creation of Al-Qaeda, with the goal of, quote, lifting the word of God to make his religion victorious. Al-Qaeda remains a secret for now, and it's believed that it was officially formed after a meeting of senior leaders from the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, Abdullah Azam himself, and Bin Laden. It's agreed that the group will pair Bin Laden's financial wealth with the skill and expertise of the Egyptian Islamic Jihadists to continue a global jihad after the defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. 1989 the Soviets withdraw from Afghanistan, prompting bin Laden to return home to Saudi Arabia as a jihadist hero. He enjoys great influence and fame and continues working for his family's construction business while leading opposition to the Saudi monarchy. Bin Laden attempts to use his al-Qaeda fighters to overthrow the pro-Soviet Yemeni Socialist Party in southern Yemen, but is stopped by the Saudi government. He also tries to prevent Yemen from unifying by assassinating political leaders in the YSP, but is once again stopped by Saudi leadership. This only deepens the wedge between the Saudi monarchy and bin Laden. Back in Afghanistan, bin Laden's hope for a unified Afghanistan is slowly disintegrating as internal fighting amongst various Afghan factions heats up. In March of that year, he leads 800 Arab fighters in the Battle of Jalalabad, during which the Afghan interim government sought to overthrow the Soviet-backed national government. Bin Laden's poor leadership, however, leads to the death of many of his own men and failure to secure strategic objectives. 1990. Bin Laden finds an unlikely partner in General Shanawaz Tanai, a hardcore communist who wishes to overthrow the Afghan government led by Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, who Bin Laden disagrees with ideologically. Bin Laden agrees to fund the coup attempt by bribing many Afghan army officials, but the coup ultimately fails. Instead, he turns to the Pakistani government 
and requests they file a motion of no confidence against Bhutto's government, to which they disagree. Later that year, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. This is a direct risk to Saudi Arabia, as the nation is ill-prepared to defend itself from Iraqi belligerents. Saddam Hussein is looking to rebuild his country economically after a disastrous war with Iran, and Saudi Arabia is the next logical stepping stone to that goal. With its abundant and developed oil fields and weak national military, the Saudi monarchy feared it was next in line. King Fahd of Saudi Arabia meets with U.S. Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, who offers direct military assistance in exchange for more influence in the region. King Fahd agrees, prompting bin Laden to seek a meeting of his own with the monarch along with the Saudi defense minister. Bin Laden requests that the king reject American military aid, seeing it as an affront to Islamic religious and cultural values. Instead, he offers to defend Saudi Arabia with his Arab legion. King Fahd presses bin Laden asking him how he would defend Saudi Arabia from Iraq's chemical and biological arsenal. Bin Laden responds they would use faith to defend themselves. King Fahd instead opts to take the Americans up on their offer. Bin Laden immediately voices opposition to the pending arrival of American troops. He denounces the Saudi government and claims that the Quran prohibits non-Muslims from setting foot on the Arabian Peninsula. Islam's holiest shrines, Mecca and Medina, should be defended only by faithful Muslims, not foreign infidels. Bin Laden pressures Saudi Islamic leaders to issue a fatwa against the government's decision to allow U.S. forces to deploy on their soil, but they refuse. On the other side of the world, on the 8th of November 1990, FBI agents raid the home of El Sayed Nasser in New Jersey. He is directly linked to Al-Qaeda, and the raid reveals vast amounts of evidence detailing planning and preparation for terrorist attacks against American targets. This was the first discovered terrorist plot of Al-Qaeda outside of the Arab world. 1991. Bin Laden's continued denouncement of the Saudi government leads to him being placed on house arrest. While this fails to deter him, he is finally exiled from his home. At that point, bin Laden is officially under U.S. surveillance, which utilizes local operatives, telephone intercepts, and collaborators to monitor bin Laden's movements. Bin Laden moves to Afghanistan under exile. 1992. Bin Laden relocates to Sudan, where he starts up a variety of legal businesses including a tannery, two farms, and a road construction company. The Sudanese government, in a show of Islamic solidarity, allows Muslims to immigrate to the country without a visa. Thousands of Mujahideen take the opportunity, opening the door for bin Laden to move many of his forces to Sudan. He even pays for 480 veteran fighters to move from Afghanistan to Sudan after Saudi Arabia pressures Pakistan to remove the Mujahideen from its shared border with Pakistan. Bin Laden's economic investments in Sudan earns him many further supporters within the Sudanese people. Bin Laden sinks large amounts of money into infrastructure, agriculture, and various businesses, and even works as an official agent in Sudan for the British firm Hunting Surveys. Bin Laden hires many of his old fighters to build roads in Sudan and is generous with the poor people of his new home. The United States government has followed bin Laden's move to Sudan but refused to allow intelligence agents to act inside the country. This is a move that'll come to haunt the U.S. Later that year, on December 29th, a bomb explodes in a hotel in Aden, Yemen, where U.S. troops had recently been staying. The Americans were on their way to a humanitarian mission in Somalia and were no longer present when the bomb detonated. Two Australian tourists are killed and two Yemeni Muslim immigrants caught in the blast are arrested for the attack. U.S. intelligence will later allege this is the first terrorist attack directly sponsored by bin Laden. 1993. On February 26th, a massive explosion rocked the parking garage under the World Trade Center. The blast came from a truck packed with explosives and was meant to send a message as the buildings were seen as a symbol of American greed and corruption. The blast creates a massive crater and kills six people, injuring up to a thousand. FBI investigators find a piece of vehicle wreckage that is so damaged it indicates it must have been either the source of the explosion or very close to it. From the wreckage, they pull a vehicle identification number, which they trace to a rented van reported stolen the day before. Islamic fundamentalist Mohammed Salameh had rented the vehicle, and on March 4th, he is arrested by FBI SWAT when he attempts to get his $400 deposit back. The ongoing investigation reveals direct links to bin Laden and al-Qaeda. Three more suspects are arrested, Nida Layad, Mahmoud Abu Halima, and Ahmed Ajaj. Investigators also discover a storage locker loaded with dangerous chemicals and enough cyanide gas to kill thousands of people. Plots to destroy various other landmarks including the UN building, the Holland and Lincoln tunnels, and the Federal Plaza in New York are also uncovered. The leader of the attack, Ramzi Youssef, remains on the run, and plans to simultaneously bomb a dozen U.S. international flights are discovered and foiled. 1994. 
Following an intelligence trail started from the 1993 investigation of the World Trade Center bombing, FBI agents storm a warehouse in New York, catching several Al-Qaeda-connected terrorists as they're assembling various bombs. Meanwhile, U.S. intelligence believes that bin Laden is financing three terrorist training camps in North Sudan. Due to bin Laden's continued opposition to the Saudi monarchy and support for extremist movements, the government revokes bin Laden's Saudi citizenship and freezes his assets inside Saudi Arabia. King Fahd also pressures his family to cut off his $7 million a year stipend. The United States declares Sudan an official sponsor of terrorism, as the Islamist political leader Hassan al-Turabi loses influence though, support for bin Laden in the country wavers, and Sudan seeks closer ties with the US, which it will refuse to grant until 2000. 1995 Ramzi Youssef, leader of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing plot, is captured by US operatives in Pakistan. In Sudan, growing discomfort over bin Laden's extremism and a failed plot to assassinate the Egyptian president by an al-Qaeda-backed group leads to secret talks between the Sudanese and the Saudis. The Sudanese wish to expel bin Laden, but the Saudis refuse to accept him back. At the same time, CIA officer Billy Waugh tracks down bin Laden inside of Sudan. He plans an operation to seize bin Laden and extradite him to the United States, but is not granted authorization. The United States still lacks solid evidence linking bin Laden to various terror attacks, meaning he doesn't have a legal basis for prosecution. There's still no indictment against bin Laden in any country. Bin Laden, meanwhile, is growing restless in Sudan, fearing his life is in danger. He's already avoided one assassination attempt, which he believes was planned by either the Egyptians or the Saudis, and likely financed by the CIA. He's recently penned an open letter to King Fahd in Saudi Arabia calling for a guerrilla campaign to remove US troops from Saudi soil. As the Americans are there by invitation, King Fahd naturally dismisses the letter. A bombing of a Saudi National Guard training center in Riyadh leads to the death of five Americans and two Indian nationals. Bin Laden denies involvement but praises the attack. When the perpetrators are later discovered, they admit to having been influenced by Bin Laden, though this confession was under heavy coercion. It's not unrealistic to think that the attack against the US-operated center was not heavily influenced by Bin Laden's virulent anti-US propaganda. The men are executed by beheading in Riyadh's main square. 1996 Under international pressure from both the United States and Saudi Arabia, Sudan officially expels bin Laden. Sudan wishes to grow closer ties to the United States and hopes the move will open up diplomatic channels long blocked by a history of hostilities. Bin Laden is allowed to choose his destination as long as the country is willing to accept him and he moves to Afghanistan. Bin Laden is forced to liquidate all of his businesses and equipment in Sudan, losing between 20 million and 300 million in total. African intelligence sources will later claim that the expulsion gave bin Laden no choice but to turn to terrorism full time, an assertion that Western intelligence quickly dismissed. Bin Laden arrives in Jalalabad with 300 Afghan Arabs who join him as part of his burgeoning terror network. In Afghanistan, bin Laden forms close ties with the founder of the Taliban, Mullah Muhammad Omar. This relationship will be instrumental in the growth of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. President Clinton, meanwhile, signs a secret order that will officially launch America's war against the al-Qaeda terror network. There's still no solid evidence linking bin Laden directly to al-Qaeda's various terror attacks, but President Clinton's order authorizes the CIA to use any means necessary to destroy his terror network. Shortly after the CIA receives secret authorization to pursue al-Qaeda and destroy it, on June 25th, a large truck packed with explosives parks next to Building 131 of the Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. The facility is being used as living quarters for US and coalition partners assigned to Operation Southern Watch, a no-fly zone operation instituted against Iraq to prevent Saddam Hussein from launching further attacks against minority groups. Building number 131 houses members of the US Air Force's 4404th Wing, pilots and support personnel from a deployed rescue and fighter squadron. 19 American airmen are killed and almost 500 coalition partners and civilians are wounded. Initially, Al-Qaeda was blamed for the attack, but later it'll be discovered that a Saudi Shiite group was responsible, with funding from Iran. Iran will be ordered to pay over $800 million in restitution to the victims by the United States in 2020. However, initial suspicion is that bin Laden helped plot the attack, turning the heat up on the man quickly becoming America's enemy number one. In order to bolster the legal case against bin Laden and authorize his capture or elimination, the United States assembles a grand jury in secret to begin a formal criminal investigation against bin Laden. That same month, bin Laden issues a declaration of jihad via a London-based newspaper in which he outlines al-Qaeda's goals, 
drive U.S. and partner non-Arab forces from the Arabian Peninsula, overthrow the Saudi monarchy, liberate Muslim holy sites across Arab lands, and support Islamic revolutionary efforts both at home and as far abroad as the Philippines. Bin Laden implores Saudi citizens to strike at the Americans currently in the Persian Gulf. Interestingly though, the fatwa against America is focused on its military forces and political leaders. Bin Laden doesn't publicly advocate for targeting of American civilians. Three months later, Bin Laden is interviewed for a British documentary. He uses the opportunity to address the United States directly. Bin Laden promises that if the United States and its Western allies do not remove themselves from the Middle East, he will wage an Islamic holy war against them. Bin Laden punctuates his threats by touting his successes in the jihad against Soviet occupation forces in Afghanistan. 1997 CNN airs an interview with Bin Laden where he accuses the United States of turning Saudi Arabia into an American colony. President George Bush Sr. had promised the Saudi monarchy that U.S. forces would leave Saudi Arabia once Iraq had been neutralized. However, by choosing to leave Saddam in power, the United States must act to contain his aggression against minority populations in Iraq. Saudi Arabia continues to grant the U.S. permission to remain within its kingdom, prompting bin Laden to once again call for the removal of the monarchy, whom he's seen as abdicating their duty as Muslims and becoming American puppets. In July, rumors circulate the United States has financed a multinational mercenary force, numbering as many as 1,000. The goal is either the arrest or killing of bin Laden, and witnesses claim to have seen 11 black land cruisers and two helicopters crossing into the Afghan city of Khost. These allegations remain rumors and unsubstantiated. Meanwhile, bin Laden is using his deepening relationship with the Taliban government to expand al-Qaeda's footprint into Afghanistan. Cut off from much of his fortune, bin Laden raises money from friendly sources who once financed Afghanistan's efforts against the Soviet occupation. Pakistan's intelligence services also help finance bin Laden's growing network of training camps for Mujahideen fighters, many of which are immediately radicalized. To move personnel and equipment around, bin Laden takes over Ariana Afghan Airlines, a national Afghan airline. He utilizes the private airline to ferry Islamic militants, weapons, cash, and opium from the United Arab Emirates to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ever the opportunist, bin Laden reaches out to international arms smuggler Victor Bout, a former Soviet translator who quickly became one of the biggest arms smugglers in the world. Bout helps bin Laden operate his airline, which the CIA describes as a terrorist taxi service. 1998. Libya issues the first Interpol arrest warrant for bin Laden, along with three of his associates. Libya is charging bin Laden with the death of Sylvan Becker, a German intelligence agent working in counterterrorism, along with his wife while in Libya on March 10, 1994. Soon after, the secret grand jury appointed by the United States indicts bin Laden on charges of conspiracy to attack defense utilities in the U.S. The indictment also names bin Laden as the head of al-Qaeda and alleges that he is a major financial backer for Islamic extremists worldwide. Bin Laden issues the first fatwa calling for the killing of American civilians. It's delivered via joint declaration with the Islamic group Al-Jihad, the Jihad movement in Bangladesh, and the jamaat ul ulema in Pakistan, who joins together under the banner of the World Islamic Front. Bin Laden's proclamation calling for the killing of U.S. civilians breaks from Sunni tradition forbidding the targeting of civilians. Acting off intelligence investigating and the growing presence of Islamic extremists in the Yugoslav War, a joint U.S.-Albanian raid results in the arrest of two men believed to be employed directly by bin Laden. The CIA retrieves many documents and computer gear. Subsequently, U.S. and Albanian forces conduct another raid two weeks later, this time arresting two Egyptian nationals believed to be linked to bin Laden. The men are handed over to Egyptian counterterrorism officials. The Egyptian people were outraged a year earlier during the Luxor massacre when terrorists killed two armed guards at the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut and trapped 58 foreign tourists. They then used machetes to kill and mutilate the civilians before finally being caught. It's believed bin Laden helped influence or finance the attack. An Egyptian jihad group sends the United States a warning, claiming they'll soon deliver a message which, quote, we hope they read with care, because we will write it, with God's help, in a language they will understand. President Bill Clinton's closest advisors convened to meet with the president. They warned President Clinton that bin Laden is actively seeking to gain access to weapons of mass destruction and chemical weapons, with American military and civilian targets as the final goal. There is significant concern over the weak state of Russian and Pakistani nuclear security. Years later, after the invasion of Afghanistan by the United States, it'll be discovered that the Pakistani Nuclear Security Service has been deeply penetrated by terrorist sympathizers. 
Explosions rock the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. The attack in Kenya kills 213, 12 of which are Americans, while injuring over 4,500. The bomb in Tanzania kills 11 and injures 85, but no Americans die. Two weeks later, the United States launches a massive cruise missile attack against al-Qaeda-linked terrorist training camps in Afghanistan as retaliation. The attack misses bin Laden by a few hours. America also targets a pharmaceutical plant in Khartoum, Sudan. And the US believes that the plant's being used to produce chemical weapons for bin Laden, but the claim remains unsubstantiated. Later, the US admitted that it had no hard evidence bin Laden was linked to the plant, though later financial documents would show bin Laden was engaged in business with the Military Industrial Corporation, a company run by the Sudanese government. An Arabic newspaper claims that bin Laden has successfully acquired nuclear weapons from former Soviet Central Asian republics. However, the claims are completely unsubstantiated and Western intelligence is very skeptical. In November, bin Laden is indicted by a federal grand jury in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York on charges of murder of U.S. nationals outside of the United States, conspiracy to murder U.S. nationals outside of the United States, and attacks on a federal facility resulting in death. The United States presents the Taliban government with evidence ranging from testimony from former al-Qaeda members and satellite phone records showing bin Laden was in contact with the perpetrators of the bombings. However, the Taliban decides not to extradite bin Laden, citing that the U.S. does not have enough evidence and further that a non-Muslim court cannot try Muslims. 1999. The U.S. Attorney's Office files the most complete indictment to date against bin Laden and 11 others. The indictment specifically names al-Qaeda as a tool of bin Laden's terror network, and it charges it with conspiracy to murder American citizens. The CIA, along with Pakistani military intelligence, assemble a team of 60 Pakistani commandos with the goal of infiltrating Afghanistan and capturing or killing bin Laden. However, the plan is aborted due to a coup d'etat launched by the Pakistani military, which succeeds in ousting the president and installing a military government. Meanwhile, the CIA finances various groups inside of Afghanistan, charging them with killing or capturing bin Laden. However, so far they have had no success but the pressure has limited bin Laden's ability to freely travel within or outside of Afghanistan. 2000. A group of foreign fighters hired by the CIA launches an RPG at a vehicle convoy housing bin Laden. The RPG misses the vehicle bin Laden is riding in, and he makes his escape. There is serious concern amongst U.S. intelligence that bin Laden is planning a major operation against the U.S., but leads are proving difficult to find or follow. Unbeknownst to U.S. intelligence, al-Qaeda operatives have already infiltrated the United States and begun preparing for the attack on the World Trade Center, scheduled for September 11, 2001. The attack aims to exploit huge vulnerabilities in U.S. airline security and will be launched in unison in order to gain the element of surprise. September 11, 2001 5.45 a.m. Hijackers Mohammed Atta and Abdul Aziz al Omari pass through the security checkpoint at Portland International Jetport in Maine. The two board a commuter flight to Boston Logan International Airport from which they will board American Airlines Flight 11. Three other conspirators will join them in Boston before boarding their flight. Of the group, three of the men are flagged by the FAA's computer passenger screening system, alerting airport screeners to conduct more thorough checks. However, FAA procedures call for the men's luggage to be screened for explosives, of which none are discovered. 7.30 a.m. approximately. Five hijackers who will board American Airlines Flight 77 pass through the West Security Checkpoint at Washington Dulles International Airport. Three of the men, Nawaf Al-Hashmi, Khalid Al-Midar, and Majed Moked, all set off metal detectors, but security officers are unable to find the hidden knives the men are carrying. At the time, knives with blades shorter than 4 inches are permissible on board American flights. All five of the hijackers of Flight 77 are also flagged by the FAA system for additional screening. But again, security personnel are only tasked with screening for explosives. The men's luggage is held until they're aboard the aircraft, and no further screening is conducted. 7.59 a.m. American Airlines Flight 11 takes off from Boston Logan International Airport, loaded with 76 passengers, 5 hijackers, and 11 crew members. All four planes hijacked are loaded with fuel for a cross-continental trip to California. 8.14 a.m. Flight 175 departs Boston, headed for Los Angeles. The flight includes nine crew, 51 passengers, and five hijackers. The plane is loaded with 76,000 pounds of fuel and departs 14 minutes late. Simultaneously aboard Flight 11, the hijackers enact their plot, taking control of the aircraft and turning it northwest, then changing course south directly toward New York City. The men use pepper spray and in knives to subdue the crew and passengers. 8.19 a.m. 
Aboard Flight 11, the first casualty of the 9-11 attacks is a man by the name of Daniel M. Lewin. He had served four years with the Israeli army, and it's believed he attempted to stop the hijacking. One of the hijackers, however, is seated directly behind him and fatally stabs him. Flight attendant Betty Ann Ong aboard Flight 11 contacts American Airlines via an in-flight phone and alerts them to the hijacking. She informs ground personnel she can't contact the cockpit. Later, it'll be presumed that both pilots were killed. Ong remains on the phone with ground personnel for 25 minutes. 8.20 AM American Airlines Flight 77 flying from Dulles International Airport to Los Angeles takes off. It's carrying six crew members, 53 passengers, and five hijackers. 8.21 AM Flight 11's hijackers turn off the plane's transponders. American Airlines is already contacting its operations center in Texas and making contact with federal officials. 8.24 AM Aboard Flight 11, hijacker Mohammed Atta accidentally presses the wrong button and instead of broadcasting a message to the passengers aboard the plane, broadcasts directly to air traffic control and nearby aircraft. The message further alerts personnel on the ground to the ongoing attack. Pilot of Flight 175, Victor J. Saracini, picks up the transmission and informs the FAA, unaware that soon his plane too will be hijacked. 8.30 AM World Trade Center staff, employees, and visitors have begun to arrive in numbers. Hundreds of personnel are preparing for the pending workday. The massive complex includes the famous Twin Towers, hubs of finance along with a hotel, four office buildings, a shopping mall, restaurants, a public plaza, and a major transportation hub. The planned activities for the day include a Risk Waters Group Financial Technology Conference, a National Association for Business Economics Conference, an evening dance performance in the outdoor plaza, and a Peace Corps information session scheduled for 6 p.m. 8.32 a.m. Flight attendant Madeline Amy Sweeney aboard Flight 11 has been attempting to contact personnel on the ground unsuccessfully when she finally makes contact with a friend, a manager at Boston Logan International Airport. For the next 12 minutes, she relays key details on the hijacking to ground personnel, including a description of the attackers. 8.37 a.m. After picking up Mohammed Atta's transmission, Boston Air Traffic Control contacts the U.S. Air Force's Northeastern Air Defense Sector in Rome, New York. The Air Force quickly mobilizes Air National Guard jets at Otis Air Force Base in Falmouth, Massachusetts and tasks them with locating and following Flight 11. 8.42 AM Flight 93 experiences a major delay and takes off much later than anticipated by the hijackers. The flight is headed for San Francisco and was supposed to take off at the same time as the other planes in order to prevent anyone from getting wind of the plot. The delay will directly lead to the failure of Flight 93's hijackers. As it climbs to the sky, Flight 93 is carrying seven crew, 33 passengers, and four hijackers. Simultaneously, Flight 175 is hijacked above northwest New Jersey, 60 miles northwest of New York City. The plane turns southwest, briefly before turning back northeast. Flight 11 is already descending into New York. 8.46 AM Flight 11 is piloted straight into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The plane hits the tower across floors 93 and 99, instantly killing all aboard the aircraft, along with hundreds inside the tower. The impact also severs all three emergency stairwells, trapping hundreds more above the impact site. Many of those people will have no choice but to jump to their deaths to avoid the flames that begin to consume the tower. An emergency response is immediately launched, though the responders believe this to be a freak accident and are unaware that it's a planned attack, and a second plane will soon be arriving. Witnessing the crash from 14 blocks north of the World Trade Center, Battalion Chief Joseph Pfeiffer directs the New York City Fire Department to issue a second alarm. Minutes later, while en route to the scene, he orders a third alarm, mobilizing 23 engine and ladder companies, 12 chiefs, and 10 specialized units to all respond. The Port Authority Police Department mobilizes and calls on units from other posts to respond to the World Trade Center to begin evacuation and rescue efforts. 8.50 AM U.S. President George W. Bush is visiting an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, when he's alerted that a plane has hit the North Tower. He's assured it was an accident. 8.51 AM Flight 77 is hijacked above southern Ohio, turning southeast. The transponder is turned off. 8.55 AM South Tower is declared secure, and a public announcement by a Port Authority fire safety employee reassures people the building is safe and that anyone in the middle of evacuating should return to their offices. The tragic announcement ensures that many more victims will become trapped later. George Mironis, who is an office manager for Daiichi Kangyo Bank, takes a photo of the debris raining down from above him and falling past his window on the 48th floor of the North Tower. He then evacuates successfully down the stairwell. On the 35th floor of the South Tower, Port Authority employee David Bobbitt takes a photo of the World Trade Center Plaza as debris from the North Tower rains down from above. 8.59 AM The Port Authority Police Department orders the evacuation of both towers. 
A minute later, they will order the evacuation of all civilians from the entire World Trade Center complex. In the North Tower, evacuees are pouring down the stairwells. Firefighters have cut open vending machines and are handing out water. The injured are being brought down the stairs by volunteers and emergency personnel. Many from the upper floors are severely burned and won't survive their injuries. One survivor would later recall passing firefighters climbing past him on the 40th floor, awestruck at their determination to climb as high as the 80th floor to reach survivors. He has no idea that many of those rescue workers were climbing to their deaths when the building ultimately collapsed. Survivors above the impact site are being forced to make a horrible decision. They cannot be reached by emergency personnel as the crashed plane has completely severed all stairwells to them. The burning jet fuel and debris are reaching temperatures hot enough to melt the structure of the building itself. They're faced with a choice of burning to death or jumping out of one of the windows. Many choose to jump, none survive. 9 AM Aboard Flight 175, passengers Garnet Ace Bailey, Peter Burton Hansen, and Brian David Sweeney have called family members to let them know of the hijacking. Brian David Sweeney leaves the following voicemail for his wife. Jules, this is Brian. Uh, this is on an airplane that's been hijacked. The thing is so well. It's not looking good. I just want you to know I absolutely love you. I want you to do good. So have a good time. Uh, thanks to my parents and everybody. And I just totally love you. And uh, I'll see you in the next Hi, babe. Hope I call you. 9.02 AM. An evacuation message is broadcast in the South Tower though it does not make it seem as if the evacuation is mandatory. Instead, occupants are told that if the situation warrants it, they should start an orderly evacuation. Many opt to, others don't. 9.03 AM United Airlines Flight 175 is flown into the World Trade Center by its hijackers. The plane hits the tower through floors 77 through 85, instantly killing all passengers and an unknown number of people inside the building. Thanks to various evacuation prompts, though, the casualties are less than those on the North Tower. The impact severs all elevator cables and two out of three stairwells. Once more, many are trapped above the impact site, prompting more workers to jump to their deaths. It's estimated that as many as 200 people choose to jump rather than face the raging fires. An ABC Live News chopper captures the moment of impact from Flight 175 as it strikes the South Tower. The live footage shocks Americans and a live audience around the world, who up until this point believe the North Tower crash was a freak accident. 9.05 AM President Bush is preparing to read a book to the assembled elementary students when an aide informs him, quote, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. Later, the president would state that he chose to continue reading the book to the students in order to not alarm them. After excusing himself from the reading lesson, the president is moved to a nearby classroom, which is converted into a temporary communication center. 9.08 AM The FAA bans all takeoff nationwide for any flight going to or through New York airspace. 9.09 AM US Air Force F-15s initially dispatched to locate Flight 11 are finally informed the plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. The planes are released from their holding pattern over Long Island. 9.13 AM The F-15s leave Long Island airspace and are headed for Manhattan, with orders to engage and destroy any aircraft that might pose a threat to civilians below. Civilian traffic is warned not to deviate from assigned flight paths. 9.17 AM CBS News correspondent Jim Stewart is the first to name Osama bin Laden as a suspect in the attacks. 9.19 AM United 93 is currently over central Pennsylvania. United Airlines flight dispatcher Ed Ballinger begins sending warning text messages to all United flights, cautioning them about cockpit intrusions and that two aircraft have already been hijacked and have collided with the World Trade Center. However, as he is sending the message to 16 different flights, the message does not reach United 93 for another four minutes. 9.24 AM An occupant of the South Tower either jumps or falls when attempting to climb down. They hit firefighter Danny Sur, killing them both. Rescue personnel notice that fewer people are jumping from the South Tower than the North Tower, likely due to the early warning they received. 9.25 AM US Air Force F-15s establish an air patrol pattern over Manhattan. 9.26 AM the FAA grounds all aircraft across the United States. At the same time, Flight 93's pilot, Jason Dahl, confirms receipt of the message warning about the hijacked aircraft. 9.28 AM Hijackers aboard Flight 93 storm the cockpit and overpower the pilots before killing them. The struggle is overheard by flight controllers in Cleveland as it's broadcast over the radio. 9.29 AM President Bush makes the first public statement on the attacks from the elementary school he is currently visiting. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a difficult moment for America. 
Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. 9.32 a.m. Flight controllers at Dulles International Airport make radar contact with Flight 77, observing that it is tracking eastbound at a very high rate of speed. 9.33 a.m. Reagan National Airport contacts the Secret Service Operations Center at the White House and informs them Flight 77 is heading straight for them and not communicating with ground control. The Secret Service begins to evacuate the White House when they're notified the plane has changed directions and is instead approaching Reagan National Airport. 9.35 a.m. The President's motorcade heads for Sarasota Braderton International Airport, where Air Force One is waiting. Meanwhile, Flight 93 changes course from its filed flight path and begins to fly eastwards. At the White House, news that Flight 77 had once more changed course prompts the Secret Service to evacuate the Vice President. 9.36 a.m. Cleveland advises the FAA Command Center it is still tracking Flight 93 and inquires if the military has launched interceptor aircraft. Air National Guard pilots Lt. Gen. Mark Sasseville and Heather Penny have rushed to waiting F-16s and taken off in pursuit of Flight 93. Believing it too would be used to attack civilians on the ground, the F-16s are in hot pursuit, but there's not been enough time to arm them. Sasseville and Penny decide that if need be, they will physically crash their own F-16s into the passenger jet and force it down. 9.37 and 46 seconds a.m. Flight 77 crashes into the west side of the Pentagon at 530 miles per hour. The section of the Pentagon impacted has recently undergone renovation and is thus largely empty. Only 125 personnel inside the Pentagon are killed, along with all 64 aboard the aircraft. The crash is captured by a security camera on a nearby checkpoint. 9.39 a.m. Aboard Flight 93, hijacker Ziad Jarrah presses the wrong button and accidentally transmits a warning to the passengers to remain seated over the radio. 9.40 a.m. Associated Press photographer Richard Drew captures an image that will soon become a ghoulish symbol of the terror attacks on the World Trade Center. Photographing the upper floors of the North Tower, Drew captures 12 photos of a man falling to his death, referred to only as the falling man. To date, attempts to positively identify the anonymous victim have been fruitless. 9.42 a.m. As the situation at the Pentagon is becoming more widely understood, senior FAA traffic manager Ben Sliney issues the execution order for SCATANA, or Plan for the Security Control of Air Traffic and Air Navigation Aids. This is a national preparedness plan meant to be issued only under case of dire national emergency, grounding all air traffic in the United States and shutting off American airspace to any incoming aircraft. It includes plans to be executed by the Department of Defense, the FAA, and the Federal Communications Commission. September 11th would be the only time that this plan has ever been implemented in its entirety, the other times being only partial implementations under exercise conditions. 9.43 a.m. The White House and Capitol building are fully evacuated and closed. 9.45 a.m. The United States airspace is shut down. Civilian aircraft are barred from taking off and all civilian traffic is ordered to immediately land at the nearest airport that can accommodate them. All incoming international flights are diverted to either Canada or Mexico, with exceptions for aircraft dangerously low on fuel. Canada follows suit and accepts incoming international flights redirected from the US, but shuts down its airspace as well in order to help protect Northern American cities and potential targets. The US and Canadian Air Forces immediately begin to launch combat air patrols in accordance with joint preparedness plans. 9.51 a.m. Chief Oriel Palmer and Fire Marshal Ronald Buca reach the 78th floor of the South Tower. They report pockets of fire and scattered bodies, but no survivors. Both men will lose their lives when the tower collapses. 9.52 a.m. The National Security Agency intercepts a phone call between a known associate of Osama bin Laden and someone in the Republic of Georgia. The caller is located in Afghanistan and states that he's heard the good news, finishing with the revelation that a fourth target would soon be hit. The NSA immediately contacts the U.S. Air Force with suspicions that Flight 93 is also going to be used in an attack confirmed. With the World Trade Center hit twice and now the Pentagon, it's believed Flight 93's target will be either the Capitol Building or the White House. 9.55 a.m. Air Force One departs from Sarasota Bradenton International Airport. The plane circles for 40 minutes as an ultimate destination is discussed. If an attempt on the President's life is forthcoming, he is safest aboard the aircraft which is directly linked to all parts of the government and the Department of Defense. 9.57 a.m. Passengers aboard Flight 93 have been corralled to the rear of the plane by hijackers. Prior to this, they've been in contact with friends and family on the ground, 
learning of the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the passengers and crew take a vote and decide that in order to spare more civilian deaths and foil the terrorist plans, they will fight the hijackers. A struggle ensues recorded on the cockpit voice recorder and later recovered from the plane's black box. 9.59 AM The South Tower collapses 56 minutes after being impacted. The collapse is captured live and broadcast to audiences around the world, with some fearing that yet another aircraft has struck the tower. Nobody inside the tower survives the collapse, including dozens of rescue workers. There's confusion in the aftermath as massive clouds of dust sweep over Lower Manhattan, with many fearing an additional attack. Due to the unique construction of the World Trade Center towers, the floors collapse in on themselves in a pancake-like fashion, pulling the entire tower down the moment floors underneath the impact site begin to buckle. The steel supporting the impact site has been weakened by fire fed by tens of thousands of gallons of jet fuel. The softened steel eventually collapses in on itself, causing 25 stories to fall 12 feet into the next floor below the impact zone. That floor inevitably collapses from the incredible strain, leading to a rapid pancake effect where each floor below the next is trying to hold up the weight of every floor above it coming down on top of it. Victim 0001 of the September 11th attacks will be Father Michael Judge, a Franciscan chaplain supporting the fire department. He is struck by falling debris while in the lobby of the North Tower and dies instantly of blunt force trauma to the head. 10 AM New York Fire Department Battalion Chief Joseph Pfeiffer, who is currently inside the North Tower, orders via radio the immediate evacuation of all emergency personnel from the tower. Various factors ensure that only a portion of the emergency responders hear the order to evacuate. Some are told by others who've received the radio call, while others never hear it at all. 10.01 AM FAA Command Center advises FAA headquarters that another aircraft has spotted Flight 93 waving its wings dramatically. Inside the hijacked aircraft, the passengers are launching a vicious counterattack against the hijackers, and the desperate pilot is trying to subdue the passengers as they make their way to the cockpit. 10.02 AM The Presidential Emergency Operations Center receives confirmation from the Secret Service of an inbound aircraft heading toward Washington. This is Flight 93. The vice president is informed that the only defense against the hijacked plane is a pair of F-16s cruising on afterburner toward the rogue plane, and without any armaments. The pilots have resolved themselves to crashing their fighters into the plane to bring it down. However, it's unknown if the F-16s will reach Flight 93 before it reaches Washington and delivers another devastating blow. 10.03 and 11 seconds AM Flight 93 crashes into the Pennsylvania countryside outside of Shanksville. Cockpit recording confirms that passengers had successfully neutralized three of the hijackers and were now attempting to break their way into the cockpit. The pilot decides to crash the plane before the passengers can take control, failing in their jihad. The passengers of Flight 93 successfully end the September 11th terror plot before it can claim more victims, just 18 minutes flight time from the terrorists' intended targets. 10.07 AM Due to poor communications, the Northeastern Air Defense Sector, which has a pair of fighters loitering over Washington, finally learns of the hijacking of Flight 93 four minutes after it's confirmed to have crashed. In the aftermath of 9-11, a focus on vastly improved communications and awareness will fall on the U.S. military in its duty to patrol and defend North American airspace. The terror attack has shown a weakness in quickly responding to threats from within, as opposed to an expected threat from outside of American airspace. 10.10 AM the National Military Command Center moves the entire U.S. military into threat condition Delta. All across the globe, U.S. forces, most of which are still unaware of the attacks in the homeland, scramble in preparation for immediate combat action against an unknown enemy. U.S. diplomats scramble to message various nations who might see the sudden move to a combat-ready posture as a direct threat to their own national security. 10.13 AM The United Nations complex is evacuated. 10.15 AM Vice President Cheney, still unaware Flight 93 has crashed, authorizes U.S. fighters to engage any inbound aircraft if they believe it to have been hijacked. 10.28 AM In the same fashion as the South Tower, the North Tower collapses. Unlike the South Tower, 16 personnel inside the building are later rescued. The collapse destroys the Marriott Hotel at the base of the two towers and causes 7 World Trade Center to begin to burn. 10.30 AM U.S. Air Force F-15s and F-16s patrol the skies over Washington, D.C. and New York City. They have orders to immediately shoot down any aircraft that do not comply with radio instructions. Later, a radar contact feared to be a hijacked aircraft is revealed to be a medevac helicopter on its way to the Pentagon impact site. The September 11th attack would result in the death of 2,977 victims, with up to 25,000 injured. 
In the years to come, the United States would launch a campaign of retribution against the Al-Qaeda network and Osama bin Laden, who was surprised by the ferocity of the U.S. response and is forced into a life of hiding until his death in a U.S. raid on May 2, 2011. Al-Qaeda as a network would be systematically dismantled by the U.S. and Allied forces, in a clandestine war that would span from the deserts of Afghanistan to Western Europe and the South China Sea. Today, Al-Qaeda is a shadow of its former self and has found temporary refuge inside Afghanistan once more controlled by the Taliban. But even there, it's not safe, as evidenced by the elimination of its senior most leader, Ayman al-Zohari, at the hands of the CIA. The organization is struggling to rebuild financially after two decades of persecution by the United States, but is suffering from not just a catastrophic loss of finances, but also leadership, given that most of its veteran cadre have been systematically eliminated by Western forces. Despite an end to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, a vengeful United States continues to put pressure on Al-Qaeda, determined to drive the group into extinction. 1979, the world casts a wary eye towards Afghanistan. The year prior, Nur Muhammad Takari had seized power and installed a communist government, much to the Soviet Union's pleasure. However, Takari's government has turned brutally oppressive with mass executions and extrajudicial arrests. The move sparks an insurgency, widely labeled as the Afghan Mujahideen. While the same name has a religious significance, the truth is the rebel forces are split along the ideological lines, with some practicing hardcore fundamentalism and others embracing secularism. They are united, however, in their wish to overthrow the Takari regime. In April, Nur Muhammad Takari is removed from power forcefully and replaced with Hafizullah Amin a few months later in September. At first, Amin tries to quell the growing rebellion with friendly overtures, but his security forces disappear thousands of people behind the scenes. The abuses only increase as time goes on, and the rebellion festers. Amin is so unpopular that the Soviet Union begins to suspect he's a CIA plant purposefully placed in power in order to collapse the Afghan communist government. On December 25, 1979, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. Its goal is simple, remove Amin from power and establish a legitimate communist government. Two days later, Soviet special forces locate and assassinate Amin. The war, if it can be called that, should be over in a matter of months. It would last 10 years. The United States is initially caught off guard by the Soviet Union invasion. Its intelligence efforts in the region have been to date an almost complete failure. The CIA and other intelligence agencies have been largely focused on Central and South America due to communism paranoia in the effort to keep the perceived threat out of America's own backyard. To date, the CIA has funneled half a million dollars worth of medical and non-lethal aid to the Mujahideen, but not supported the insurgency in any significant way. Soviet fears of American intervention in Afghanistan are hilariously overblown. But that will soon change. Discussions about Soviet interventionism in Afghanistan have been taking place for months, though nobody suspected a full-blown invasion was truly imminent. America has a very real interest in making the Afghan situation difficult for the Soviets, but differ on how important it truly is. For some, Afghanistan is a chance to pay back the Soviet Union for its interference in Vietnam, a war that cost the US dearly in manpower and capital. Others fear that increasing aid to the Mujahideen would only encourage the Soviets to more directly intervene. An April 5th memo by National Intelligence Officer Arnold Horlick lays out the stakes. Covert action would raise the cost to the Soviets and inflame Muslim opinion against them in many countries. The risk is that a substantial U.S. covert aid program could raise the stakes and induce the Soviets to intervene more directly and vigorously than otherwise intended. Preliminary meetings with the Mujahideen leadership have already been undertaken, but still, the U.S. has played a cautious hand in Afghanistan. The Soviet invasion changes all of that. Texas Democrat Congressman Charlie Wilson watches the invasion take place from a hot tub in Las Vegas. A playboy at heart, Wilson nonetheless is shocked at the brutality of Soviet bombing of Afghan civilians and vows to do something to help the Afghan people. With the best of intentions, he sets out to build a Washington coalition with one purpose, push for the direct military support of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Seeing an opportunity for payback and to force the Soviet Union to lose its focus in Africa, the program to aid the Mujahideen, now codenamed Operation Cyclone, is approved. At first, Operation Cyclone aims to keep U.S. involvement in the war within the realm of plausible deniability. To this effect, the program initially focuses on providing training and logistical support to the Mujahideen, as well as equipping them with Soviet-made weapons purchased by the CIA covertly. With Iran on one side, though, and the Soviets directly north, 
This leaves the US with only Pakistan as a route into the country. This is a difficult position for the US, as Pakistan's recent development of nuclear weapons has put a severe strain between the two nations. In order to improve relations, it's decided that Pakistan would be granted near full control over the dissemination of American aid to the Mujahideen. Some within the CIA, State Department, and other agencies express concern over the decision, as Pakistan clearly favors the more fundamentalist forces inside Afghanistan itself. Their concerns are ignored, with inevitable disastrous future consequences. In order to coordinate the influx of America's funding, equipment, and weapons, Pakistan's President Mohammad Zia ul Haq turns to the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, at the time a Pakistani intelligence agency struggling for legitimacy. The massive responsibility of coordinating millions of dollars in US aid, however, skyrockets the agency's legitimacy, cementing it as an instrument of power in Pakistan for decades to come. This too would eventually be a mistake. Massive refugee camps are set up along the Pakistan border, and the United States contributes millions of dollars in humanitarian aid to these camps. Sensing an opportunity, however, hardline fundamentalist clerics from Saudi Arabia and other Muslim nations converge on the camps, slowly indoctrinating tens of thousands of young Afghan men into religious fundamentalism. One of these Saudi holy men bears the name Osama bin Laden, whose family owns a construction firm worth millions of dollars and has close ties to the Saudi government. Despite early warning signs that bin Laden and others are preaching a dangerous fundamentalist form of Islam to vulnerable young men who will soon be armed to the teeth, the United States ignores these warnings and continues on with almost no oversight of Pakistan's dissemination of US aid. Even worse, the US now directly helps spread the message of radical Islam, believing it to be a valuable recruitment tool. Right here in America, the CIA enlists Egyptian double agent Ali Abdul Saud Mohammed and sends him to recruit American Muslims to fight in Afghanistan. Operating out of the Kifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn, Muhammad preaches a fiery message of holy war to impressionable youths, bolstering the ranks of the Mujahideen. Around the world, the CIA encourages similar recruitment efforts, helping funnel tens of thousands of volunteer fighters to Pakistan. Muhammad would eventually make his way to Pakistan as well, where he would use his US Army training to instruct both Ayman al-Zahari, the founder of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, and Osama bin Laden. Inside Afghanistan, the grinding war against the Soviet occupation continues on. American aid is now supplemented by the British, Saudi Arabia, and even China, whose own relations with the Soviet Union have seriously deteriorated. The British, leading the second greatest effort after the Americans, have thrown much of their support behind Ahmad Shah Massoud. Massoud is a brilliant guerrilla commander, instrumental in the defeat of several Soviet offensives, and is a growing national hero to the Afghan people. However, his fearsome militia is increasingly being infiltrated by hardline fundamentalists. While Massoud himself is a moderate, he has no choice but to accept the troops available to him. The MI6 thus arms Massoud's militia with thousands of rifles, mines, explosives, radios, and 50 missile launchers with 300 missiles. The British even used the SAS to train Massoud's militia directly. One thing is becoming clear though, moderate voices within the Afghan resistance are becoming increasingly scarce. Pakistan and America may be allied in their wish to see the Soviets evicted from Afghanistan, but their long-term vision for the nation differs greatly. For one, America doesn't have one. It's not even remotely invested in the long-term state of Afghanistan, even as it becomes increasingly clear the Soviet Union can't maintain this invasion forever. This leaves the door wide open for Pakistan to shape the future of Afghanistan as it sees fit. For starters, it views the nation as a vital buffer between itself and Iran. It also needs a future Afghanistan that will not become a close US ally. Pakistan fears that the United States, who does not look favorably on Pakistan after its development of nuclear weapons, might use Afghanistan as a staging ground for its own invasion in a bid to strip Pakistan of nuclear arms. Thus, it must make sure that the future Afghanistan is one hostile to US interests. Luckily, the indoctrination of tens of thousands of Afghan youths and volunteer mujahideen by extremist clerics provides the opportunity they need. The ISI works busily to build strong relationships with the most fundamentalist of militias, funneling American weapons and money to them directly while choking off moderate forces. Pakistan's not particularly invested in the growing fundamentalist Islamic movement within the Mujahideen, but the movement proves to be a powerful binding force and the promise of a strong future government for the nation, which will be greatly indebted to Pakistan, of course. Even as warnings of rising fundamentalism continue to rise, they are ignored, 
and in 1985, President Ronald Reagan ends all pretenses by announcing America's global support of anti-Soviet resistance movements. Even as much as a few years ago this would have been impossible and tantamount to a declaration of war against the Soviet Union, but news back home and in the USSR are not good. The country is experiencing increasing political unrest, and the war in Afghanistan, as well as the Soviet support for communist guerrilla movements around the world, are straining the Soviet economy. Reagan senses an opportunity to strike a definitive blow against the Soviet Union. With the declaration of the Reagan Doctrine, the flow of weapons and money to the Mujahideen increases exponentially. Free of the restraint of having to support the movement covertly, the CIA no longer has to limit its efforts by purchasing Soviet-made weapons. Reagan's proclamation allows the US now to arm the Mujahideen with more modern and far more capable weapons. For years, the Soviet Air Force has wreaked havoc against the Mujahideen. Soviet hind attack helicopters have been particularly deadly opponents, hunting down and annihilating Mujahideen forces even in their traditional safe zones high up in the mountains. Starting in 1985, the US arms the Mujahideen with the Stinger shoulder-fired surface-to-air missile system, and almost immediately Soviet aircraft losses skyrocket. The effectiveness of the weapon would be hotly debated for decades to come, but one thing's for sure. After its introduction in Afghanistan, the Soviet Air Force no longer operated as brazenly as it had before. This allows the Mujahideen to make serious inroads in its fight against the Soviets. It's only with the introduction of the Stinger to the Mujahideen and the reports of mounting Soviet aircraft losses that America begins to show some concern over its to date completely unchecked tidal wave of money and weapons to Afghanistan. There are growing worries that the Stingers will eventually make their way out of the country and be used to shoot down civilian or military aircraft, perhaps even American ones. For the first time, the US takes note of the rising wave of dangerous fundamentalism against the Mujahideen, though ultimately America continues to leave Pakistan in charge of who receives what. Inevitably, the Soviet Union is forced to limp out of Afghanistan in 1989, suffering over 14,000 dead and 50,000 wounded. The war is over, the Mujahideen successful. Yet, even as moderates like Ahmad Shah Massoud are being forced into the peripheries of post-Soviet Afghanistan, the only concern that the United States shows in what happens next is the retrieval of the Stinger missile units provided to the Mujahideen. In what would become the single most baffling foreign policy decision of the 20th century history, President Ronald Reagan and successor H.W. Bush show absolutely no interest in the shaping of future Afghanistan. Even as civil war breaks out between extremist fundamentalists and the vastly outnumbered moderates, the United States pays no attention. With the direct aid and support of Pakistan, extremist forces take over most of the country, leaving what has become the moderate United Islamic Front for the Salvation of Afghanistan or Northern Alliance in control of only 5-10% to of the nation. With the formation of the Taliban government, Pakistan has achieved its strategic goals in the nation, all on America's dime. On September 9, 2001, moderate leader and national hero Ahmad Shah Massoud, once backed directly by MI6, is assassinated by the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who both fear that in their coming attack against America and the US's inevitable response, Massoud would be installed as a popular leader to reunite the nation against the Taliban. Israeli fighter jets and bombers are launched across the Syrian border. Reports from Assad spies indicate that North Korean nuclear scientists have been working in Syria for some time now. The pilots know that the stability of the world may be at stake if they don't hit their target in time. In 2000, Mossad, Israel's foreign intelligence service, began closely observing the newly elected Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. They were unsure exactly what type of leader he would be, but soon after taking power, Assad met with some very unsettling people. In 2001, several North Korean dignitaries were welcomed into Syria. It was not clear what their true intentions were, but in the coming years a secret would be uncovered that would force Israel to risk all-out war. Mossad continued to keep tabs on Syria and North Korean relations when something truly scary was discovered. There was mounting evidence that North Korea was helping Syria develop some sort of facility capable of constructing weapons of mass destruction. At this point, it was only a rumor, but if Syria had nuclear capabilities, it could be disastrous for Israel and the rest of the world. Worse yet, if the nuclear weapons were being developed by North Korea, it meant that their own agenda might have been at play in Syria. In collaboration with the United States, Israel began to dig deeper. In 2004, U.S. intelligence intercepted several communications between Syria and North Korea. It was not entirely clear what was being discussed, but the CIA was eventually able to trace the calls to an isolated location in the Syrian desert. This area was called Al-Kibar, and it was immediately added to Israel's watch list. The question still remained, however. What were Syria and North Korea working on in the desert? 
could they be building weapons of mass destruction? More information was needed. Then in 2006, Mossad launched a covert operation to recover intelligence and assassinate a top Syrian official. This would occur in an unlikely location. The operation was not to be carried out in the Middle East, but in London. Recent evidence suggests that the man being targeted by Mossad was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission of Syria, Ibrahim Ottman. The documents containing information about the mission are still classified, so it's not entirely clear if Ottoman was the person Israeli intelligence was after. Regardless of precisely who was being tracked by Mossad in London, one thing was for sure, the person had vital information that Israel desperately needed. At the end of their daring operation, Israel would uncover secrets that would result in the bombing of al kibar The Syrian official landed at Heathrow Airport under a false name. Israeli agents followed him as he made his way to London. After the official checked into his hotel, several undercover agents set up locations in the area to monitor his activity and take the shot if needed. Eventually, they caught a break. The official left his hotel room to head to the Syrian embassy and go shopping in the city. While he was out, the agents broke into his room. Members of the Nevoit division, who specialized in infiltration and hacking, bugged the Syrian official's computer and extracted as much information as they could from it. There were also other agents on the mission. They were part of the Kidon division, who specialized in the assassination of high-profile targets. It would seem that the plan might have been to assassinate the Syrian official, but it never came to that. Instead, the information found on the official's computer shocked Mossad. The agents were ordered to get as much intel as they could without alerting Syria that they were onto them. They installed software that gave Mossad access to the system and allowed them to monitor the activity on the device. As the analysts at Mossad sifted through the data, they were horrified at what they found. Right there in front of them were hundreds of pictures of blueprints of the al kibar facility. It seemed to be nearing completion, and what it was being built for was Israel's worst nightmare. In one photograph, North Korean nuclear official Chon chi Bu met with Ibrahim Ottman, and this could only mean one thing. North Korea and Syria were in fact working together to create some type of military site within Syrian borders. All evidence suggested that the mysterious facility being built at al kibar was in fact a nuclear plant to enrich plutonium. At this point, Mossad informed the Prime Minister of the threat being constructed just beyond Israel's borders. North Korea nuclear scientists were actively working in Syria to help finish the facility, which would allow them to create weapons of mass destruction. But there was even worse news coming to light. Another player in the construction of al kibar was being uncovered, and it was one of the last people Israel wanted to get involved with. Iran had been funneling money into the Syrian-North Korean nuclear venture this whole time. They did it in case their own enrichment program failed. It was estimated that Iran had invested around $1 billion into the project. Israel desperately needed to gather more information about the nuclear threat that was being constructed in Syria with the help of North Korea and Iran. Mossad sent spies to infiltrate the facility disguised as workers. They gathered more details and took pictures of the site. It was not yet completed, but it was further along than Israel had hoped. However, the spies had only so much access to the facility, and Israel needed more detailed intel on what exactly would be made at al kibar They didn't want to blow the cover of their spies, so Mossad decided to send in a commando unit from the Sayeret Matkal Reconnaissance Division to raid the site. Their mission was to bring back hard evidence that the structure was being used for nuclear development. The pictures of the facility were very suggestive, but without hard proof, Israel could not justify taking action. The commando team, made up of 12 men, went in at night. They were carried by two helicopters and dropped off just outside the facility. Using the cover of darkness, they made their way to al kibar They stealthily moved through the facility, doing their best to not engage any of the guards on duty. The commando team took pictures and more importantly collected soil samples to be analyzed. If the soil showed signs of radiation, then Israel would have the evidence they needed to justify moving on al kibar The commando team was in the middle of gathering additional intel when they were spotted by Syrian soldiers. A firefight broke out. The commandos covered one another as they made their way out of the facility. Using suppressing fire, they were able to evacuate to the extraction site where they were ferried back to safety. Although the team's mission was cut short, they managed to take numerous photos and collect soil samples. Upon landing in Israel, the soil was sent to a lab for analysis. When the results came back, it was as they feared. The soil was irradiated. This confirmed all of Israel's suspicions. The North Korean scientists were there to help the Syrians build a nuclear facility. The cat was out of the bag. Israel knew that if the North Koreans and the Syrians were allowed to complete their project, it could destabilize the whole region, perhaps even leading to a nuclear war. There were talks between the United States and Israel about an airstrike on the facility, but to this day, the US claims they did not support what happened next. The fear from the CIA was that if the site was bombed, it would certainly lead to war. But Israeli intelligence assured them that if it were done covertly and not publicized, Assad would not retaliate. US leaders were not convinced and preferred to condemn Syria publicly rather than take direct action. Israel felt that this would have no effect on Syria's decisions, and therefore they were going to carry out the airstrike without the support of their biggest ally. As Israel planned their bombing mission into Syria, 
Korea, a new threat began to unfold. Days before the planned attack, a North Korean cargo ship docked at the Syrian port of Tartus. The shipment it was carrying was labeled as cement, but this could have been a disguise for critical equipment or even nuclear material that was being brought to the Al Kibar facility. Israel decided it was time to strike. Between the North Korea and Syrian collaboration, the photographic evidence, and the irradiated soil, they had enough evidence to justify their next move. On September 6, 2007, Israel launched 10 F-15I Ram fighter jets armed with laser-guided bombs. They were escorted by a squadron of F-16I Sufa fighter jets. In order to mask their flight path, Israel used electronic warfare to take over Syrian air defense systems and fed them false data. They made it appear as though the skies were clear, when in fact the strike force was well on its way. Their first target was a Syrian radar site at Tal al-Abad. They destroyed it using conventional precision bombs and then moved on to their primary target. On the ground was a squad of Israeli Shaldag commandos that used a targeting laser to identify and cite the facility for the bombers. They waited a safe distance until the bombs were dropped, then confirmed that the site had been destroyed and made their way back to safety. All Israeli aircraft and soldiers returned home and their mission was a success. Immediately after the bombing, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert contacted the Turkish Prime Minister and asked him to relay a message to Bashar al-Assad. The message stated that Israel would not allow a nuclear facility to be built in the region, but no further action would be taken against them at the time. It was also mentioned that Israel only wanted peace and that if Syria did not draw attention to what happened, neither would Israel, and everything could go back to normal. The tactic worked as Assad initially remained silent. It seemed as if he wanted to keep what happened in Syria as quiet as possible. It was actually North Korea who condemned Israel's actions first. In a statement, North Korean leader said, this is a very dangerous provocation, little short of wantonly violating the sovereignty of Syria and seriously harassing the regional peace and security. The following year, Michael Hayden, the director of the CIA, made it clear the danger that the North Korean-Syrian collaboration would have posed. He stated that the al kabar site could have produced enough plutonium for one or two nuclear weapons per year, and that the facility was very similar to North Korea's Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center. Whether Israel was right to bomb the facility in al kabar or not can be debated, but there's no doubt that the site posed a risk to the stability of the world and needed to be addressed one way or another. Osama bin Laden was known for using unconventional methods of attack against his targets, but did he ever get his hands on the ultimate weapon? After the 9-11 attacks, people around the world were waiting for the next shoe to drop, and many people feared that shoe could take the form of a mushroom cloud. But how would Al-Qaeda get their hands on a nuclear bomb? Was it possible? And did he actually have one in storage waiting for the right moment? One thing was for sure, Al-Qaeda was never going to have the resources to build a nuclear bomb. Only nine countries have ever done this successfully, and most of them are powerful and wealthy nations. Those who aren't had support from allies in their programs. Al-Qaeda never got any powerful patrons and was usually viewed as an unwelcome guest even by the governments that hosted them, with Pakistan, Sudan, and Afghanistan rarely giving bin Laden any formal support. Would any of the nuclear nations risk helping Osama bin Laden get his hands on one? Most of the candidates are obviously flat out. The United States, France, Great Britain, India, and Israel were all enemies of Al-Qaeda. For all of Russia's tension with the United States, they were not likely to help either. After all, they have problems with Muslim extremists in their Chechnya region and were frequently targeted by terror attacks. In a similar vein, China might be a geopolitical enemy of the United States, but their goal is a stable world where they're the dominant power, and that's certainly not helped by nuclear-armed terrorists. Which leaves two wild cards. North Korea, the world's newest nuclear power, often comes off as the most unstable. Its leader, Kim Jong-un, frequently boasts of using his nuclear missiles against the West and might be willing to help enemies of the U.S. gain their own weapons. But would he be willing to cooperate with Al-Qaeda? Unlikely, because Al-Qaeda is seen as too much of a wild card even for the Kim dynasty. And once the weapon leaves North Korea, it's impossible to know how it would wind up being used. And if an Al-Qaeda bomb is used against the West and is traced back to North Korea, it could end with U.S. bombers over North Korea. So that just leaves Pakistan. The second newest nuclear power, Pakistan, had by far the closest link to Al-Qaeda, with Osama bin Laden eventually being hunted down in his Abbottabad compound in 2011. Questions remain about how much the Pakistani government knew about Al-Qaeda's activity in the country, which is probably why the U.S. didn't loop them in while plotting the mission to take out the terror leader. But despite this, the government tries to maintain friendly relations with the U.S., hoping they'll reign in India in the Kashmir region. So it's highly unlikely that the Pakistani government would provide Al-Qaeda with weapons that could be used against the U.S. But that doesn't mean no one would. 
Like any government, the Pakistani government is full of differences of opinion. They might not be getting into brawls on the floor of parliament that the South Koreans do, but you definitely have a struggle between militants and moderates. Additionally, the many scientists who worked on the nuclear program have their own agendas, and it is possible that one of them might be sympathetic enough to the terror group to help Osama bin Laden craft his own bomb. But this might be unlikely for a number of reasons. For one thing, you can't just give someone a nuclear bomb, at least not easily. The lightest nuclear bomb in the US arsenal weighs around 700 pounds, so it's not something you just pass along. And once you have it, delivering it is another matter. The bombs aren't easy to set off, and they're not going to be much use without a delivery mechanism, and Pakistan doesn't have any delivery mechanism that could hit the US easily. So even if a rogue scientist did pass along a bomb to Al-Qaeda, the country that would be most at risk from it going off would likely be Pakistan itself. But that's not the only potential source for a nuclear bomb. During the Cold War, the United States and Russia went a little, well, crazy. Today, both countries have more than 10 times the number of nuclear weapons of any other country. The United States has most of its bombs either in missile silos on the homeland or on ships deployed abroad, or deployed in NATO nations as a deterrent. The Soviets did the same thing, but there's one difference. The borders of Russia have changed a lot since the days of the Soviet Union, and the Soviets deployed their massive stockpile of weapons around their territory that included places like Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, all of which are independent countries now. In the aftermath of the collapse of the USSR, all those countries voted to give up their nuclear weapons and have them transferred back to Russia in exchange for guarantees of safety. But did that really work out? Well, it certainly didn't for Ukraine in terms of the guarantees, but we're also not so sure it worked out entirely for the nuclear weapons. There were a lot of bombs out there, in the thousands, and the governments may not have been able to round them all up. There have been persistent reports of nuclear bombs on the black market, even possibly being up for sale on the dark web. Is there any truth to this? Would getting a nuclear bomb be as simple as Al-Qaeda making a Bitcoin purchase? It's not clear, but even if they did manage to get an old Soviet bomb, they would face some major stumbling blocks. For one thing, they'd still need to deliver and detonate it, and second, no one's even sure how many of those old Soviet nukes still work. The good news is, Osama bin Laden never likely had a path to a city-destroying nuclear bomb. The bad news is, he had another option. Currently in the news, Vladimir Putin is yelling that Ukraine is about to detonate a dirty bomb and blame it on Russia, to which Ukraine responded, dude, you're the guy threatening to nuke people every 30 seconds. But what exactly is a dirty bomb? Unlike nuclear bombs, which are fission devices that create a massive explosion that could devastate an entire city, dirty bombs are conventional explosives. They still pack a radioactive punch. That's because they're constructed with radioactive material, usually surplus material from nuclear plants or nuclear programs. The initial detonation of a bomb might look very similar to a standard car bomb or a briefcase bomb, but the effects would only become clear later because radioactive material would be dispersed through the air and begin poisoning people. In the best case scenario, this could render a large area of a city uninhabitable until lengthy decontamination efforts. With a heavy dose, it could kill thousands from radiation poisoning and render a city a no-go zone for years. And this isn't simply a hypothetical. Way back in 1995, Russia discovered firsthand that terrorists were trying to go nuclear. Chechen separatists, demanding independence for their heavily Muslim region, tried to force the hand of President Boris Yeltsin by detonating an explosive loaded with cesium-137 in a public park in Moscow. But it was apparently too much of an escalation even for the Chechens. One of the rebel leaders tipped off the media, the bomb was found and defused, and it was only after the fact that people realized just how dangerous this could have been. Three years later, they made a second attempt and once again warned people, meaning both attacks largely amounted to an elaborate scare tactic. But a few years later, someone tried to bring this terror to the United States. Everyone was still on edge in 2002 when authorities arrested a man named Jose Padilla. He was an American convert to Islam and an Al-Qaeda member in custody had tipped off American sources that he was trying to obtain a dirty bomb to detonate on US soil. He was quickly arrested and it became clear that he was fairly far along in the process with one key step. He had to get the actual radioactive material. While that is kind of a big step, he was actively scouting for it and seeking the best places to detonate it. Padilla was ultimately sentenced to over two decades in prison, which his defenders say was extreme for a man who may have just had some crazy ideas and no way to carry them out. But it was another clear piece of evidence that the threat of a dirty bomb was absolutely on the mind of Al-Qaeda members. And this pattern continued over the next few years. 
In 2006, a radical named Diren Barot plotted to target American and British financial buildings with a dirty bomb, but he planned to use low-yield devices that would be unlikely to cause deaths. His main goal seemed to be to contaminate the buildings long-term, but he was never able to get a hold of a radioactive material, a common pattern, because with each failed attack, the odds are that countries with nuclear material are keeping them locked up tighter and tighter. So, is it likely that Bin Laden never got his hands on some? With access he had to the former Soviet republics and potential rogue agents within the Pakistani nuclear program, it's impossible to rule it out. What we do know is that he never used them and none of the terrorists who attempted to use dirty bombs ever succeeded in getting their hands on radioactive material. Knowing Osama bin Laden's ambition, it's likely that if he had the chance he absolutely would have used it. But there is one more X factor, which is that Osama bin Laden never successfully hit the US homeland again. In the aftermath of the attacks, security was ramped up massively around the United States, particularly at the borders, on airplanes, and in shipping lanes, so it would have been incredibly difficult for a terror group to smuggle a large nuclear or radioactive device into position to use against the United States. It's possible that the closing of these openings led to Osama scaling back his plans and concentrating on consolidating his power in Muslim nations and keeping himself alive and ahead of SEAL Team 6, which he was able to successfully do for almost 10 years. But that doesn't mean terrorists have stopped trying. Osama bin Laden is dead and buried in the deep ocean, but he's found equally ruthless successors. The army of Daesh, also known as ISIS, has become notorious for its brutal terror attacks in Muslim nations and in Europe, and in 2014 a group of militants attacked Mosul University in Iraq. Their target? 88 pounds of uranium compounds. There was only one problem, it was unenriched, so it couldn't be used for a nuclear bomb, but it was a potential contaminant for a dirty bomb, although uranium isn't the most radioactive isotope that could be used. So ultimately Osama bin Laden was never able to take the last leap into being a nuclear threat. Beyond the extreme difficulty of getting a hold of a nuclear or radioactive weapon, the main appeal of these weapons is the psychological impact and economic disruption of contaminating an area of a city. It's also likely to be viewed as a massive escalation by the country targeted and lead to immediate and massive military retaliation. So while Osama bin Laden likely would have loved to get his hands on a nuclear weapon, it might not have helped him in the long run and it might have even led to him meeting his end even sooner. How did Osama bin Laden become the world's most wanted man? This is how the Al-Qaeda leader went from nobody to monster. As a young man, the son of a Saudi billionaire and his 10th wife, Osama bin Laden had a fairly normal childhood. He inherited millions of dollars from his father's family, went to college for economics and business administration, and combined a deep devotion for Islam with a love of secular elements and culture like soccer. He even studied briefly at Oxford and became a fan of the English soccer club Arsenal. And his personal life didn't give away a future terrorist either. Osama bin Laden got married for the first time in 1974 and then kept getting married. By 1987, he had four wives, although he was divorced once. This wasn't uncommon for Saudi elites, and he was soon father many times over. He was described as a strict father and someone who lived a humble, frugal lifestyle, but certainly not a dangerous man. But tragedy would soon enter his life, and that might have been his start of darkness. Bin Laden's father died in 1967 in a plane crash caused by his American pilot. In 1988, his half-brother would also die in a plane crash while visiting the United States. Did these two family tragedies start him on the path to hatred of the United States? It's possible. But the roots of his hatred might be found in another conflict. Bin Laden was a millionaire, and he chose to use that money in an unlikely way, buying his way into an ongoing war. The Soviet Union was at war with Afghanistan, having invaded the Central Asian nation to ensure their hegemony in the region. Bin Laden watched as the powerful army routed the Afghan rebels, and he was enraged. The devoutly Muslim Bin Laden felt like he had to do something, so he traveled to Pakistan and joined the militant Abdullah Azam in funding the rebellion there. And that would be the beginning of his descent into radicalism. While this was Bin Laden's first brush with the war against his superpower, it would not be the trigger that made him the most wanted man in the world. After all, the Soviets didn't view him in any different way from any other Afghan soldier. As for the West, and particularly the United States, they actually found him pretty useful. After all, the Soviets were their geopolitical enemies, and anyone who could make their life more difficult was welcome. While he certainly wasn't directly trained by the United States despite what some conspiracy theorists claim, he had a significant relationship with Saudi intelligence, and the Mujahideen as a whole were backed by the United States. And then things went horribly wrong. As the war went on and Bin Laden's money helped the Afghans turn the tide, he turned his little rebel startup into a larger operation. 
Soon, training camps were showing up all around Pakistan and Afghanistan. Word started getting out about the resistance against the Soviets, and Osama bin Laden started to become a name in Arab media. He was seen as an underdog, ruthlessly defending Muslim land against a superpower that thought it could take what it wanted. And as the war in Afghanistan wound down, he would turn his attention to other targets. And that's when things started to unravel. Why did he become so radicalized? Part of it might have started in 1988, when bin Laden was apparently involved in the Gilgit Massacre, a brutal targeting of Shia Muslims in Pakistan. This was reportedly in response to an attack on Sunni villages, but it was the first time bin Laden turned his attention to violent reprisals against fellow Muslims instead of colonizing armies, and it was the first indication that he could become a serious threat. Seven things were about to go south in a hurry. By 1988, Osama had split from the larger Afghan resistance movement and created his own group, Al-Qaeda. Unlike the larger, scrappier group, bin Laden treated his new organization like a well-oiled machine only taking recruits if they matched up with his strict moral beliefs. But it was still a minor player in world affairs focused on defending Muslim lands and training an army of radicals that would resist the colonization of superpowers. And after years of being backed by the West, he had no reason to go to war with them, especially as they haven't tried to take over any other Muslim power at the time. But that was all about to change. Ironically, the start of bin Laden's descent into madness wouldn't be an invasion but an invitation. He returned to Saudi Arabia a conquering hero in 1989, where he used his resources to influence Afghan and Pakistani politics from afar. He also tried to get involved in the chaotic politics of Yemen, but was restrained by Saudi leaders. Then the war came home, as Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded the Persian Gulf nation of Kuwait to seize its oil, and the entire world rallied to stop him. Part of that effort was stationing of Western troops in Saudi Arabia as a convenient staging ground and to protect the Saudis if Saddam came for them next. But bin Laden didn't see it that way. While the Saudis saw the US forces as a guarantee, bin Laden saw it as an invasion. He met with the Saudi king to warn him not to allow US troops and was asked for his plan. His response, we will fight him with faith, which shockingly was not deemed an acceptable answer. The US troops came to Saudi Arabia and bin Laden lost his mind. He tried to rally the nation's clerics to denounce the royal family, but they refused. He proceeded to gather his radical followers, and they decided that if the US troops wouldn't leave on their own, he would make them. And from here, things would escalate in a hurry. The first signs of how far he was willing to go would come in November 1990, when the FBI raided the associate of an Al-Qaeda operative living in New Jersey. They were looking for evidence of terror plots, and they found them in spades. The plans of Al-Qaeda had apparently expanded from local ones, and now they were targeting New York skyscrapers and prominent right-wing rabbis, including one who was murdered only three days before the raid. While they didn't have airtight evidence tying the plots to bin Laden yet, it was clear who was pulling the strings, and the Saudis would soon take action. It was 1991 when the Saudis finally had enough of bin Laden publicly insulting their government over the US deal and moved to expel him from the country. He was stripped of his citizenship and sent abroad, first settling in Afghanistan with his followers and eventually moving to Sudan. He favored desert countries with a weak central government, so he could quietly build an arsenal and a network of training camps without the authorities getting involved. The United States was now aware of his activities and viewed him as a potential threat, but he was still a minor factor in the dying days of the Cold War. But that was about to change. Around the world, explosions started happening. First, a bomb went off at a hotel in Yemen where US troops were staying. While the bomb didn't kill any soldiers, a second bomb at another hotel killed two civilians. No one knew who was behind the attack yet, because bin Laden was staying below the radar. When the World Trade Center's underground garage was bombed in New York the following year, killing six people, bin Laden was never formally charged, but the mastermind was revealed to have trained under bin Laden. From there, he would only escalate. He would successfully pull off his first attack against the American troops in 1995 on a facility in Saudi Arabia. Five Americans and two Indians were killed, and it was the first time a government publicly blamed Al-Qaeda for a terror attack. But bin Laden was still well underground and the heat was on. He was in Sudan at the time, and the US deployed CIA agents to apprehend him. However, the Sudanese refused to cooperate, and there was no formal warrant out for bin Laden at the time, so he was just left to continue his activities. That was a deadly mistake. It would be June 1996 when most people heard Osama bin Laden's name for the first time as a massive truck bomb hit the Kobar Towers complex in Saudi Arabia. This was a base for US Air Force members, and 19 were killed in the blast. 
At first, a branch of the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah was blamed for the attack, but that would soon turn out to be false, as Osama bin Laden decided to make a public declaration of war on the United States. Known as his first fatwa, it blamed the United States for continued presence on Saudi soil and spread elaborate conspiracy theories about the US and Israel's plans for the Middle East. It was now clear to the American authorities that he was going to be a major threat. It wouldn't be long before he struck again. Targeting American soldiers was one thing, and bin Laden was mostly seen as just another battlefield enemy to be conquered, but at the core of his radical view was that the war wasn't just necessary against American forces. All Americans and their allies, no matter where they were, were legitimate targets for his forces. And he decided to prove that with a series of attacks in 1998 against the most important and protected sites in the diplomatic world, embassies. Attacking an embassy is considered one of the highest crimes in international law, and bin Laden wanted the world to know how big of a threat he was. So he didn't just attack one, he attacked two. Simultaneously on August 7, 1998, a pair of bombings took place in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and Nairobi, Kenya, hitting U.S. embassies in both locations. These attacks killed more than 200 people, most of them civilians, and took place only weeks after the first major Al-Qaeda Congress, where they plotted their next moves. If the world hadn't taken Osama bin Laden's threat seriously before, they would now. And when the United States government takes a threat seriously, they have a clear way of showing it. Osama bin Laden had just earned himself a place on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, with a hefty cash reward offered for his apprehension. This list is usually known for hosting drug kingpins, murderers on the run, and other domestic rogues, but it's been known to host terrorists and international criminals, and few posed bigger threats than bin Laden. But despite the cash prize, bin Laden was still on the run abroad, and few bounty hunters were willing to hunt for him in the challenging territory of Sudan, so it fell on the government to find another way. In the aftermath of the embassy bombing, Bill Clinton ordered a missile strike on terrorist training camps in Sudan, but they didn't succeed in targeting bin Laden and were largely condemned by governments in the region. Bin Laden remained on the loose and continued collecting an army of militants to target Americans and their allies around the world. As the turn of the millennium came, he would pull off another shocking attack, bombing the USS Cole destroyer and killing 17 sailors. It was his first successful strike against a major US military ship, and Bin Laden was now firmly in place as the number one threat to US security and the most wanted man in the world, and he was just getting started. Want to learn more? Watch how the CIA funded a terrorist organization for more on Osama's early days, or how SEAL Team took down Osama bin Laden minute by minute for how it all ended.